Welcome once again to Works in Theory. I'm your red beshirted host, E. American Johnson, and with us as always is the beneficent and mellifluous slopstache. I don't know what either of those words mean, by the way. I think one means um, sweet sounding, so thank you. Mm, you do sound pretty sweet. Look at your little teacup. I love it. You're, you're f finally doing something with the theme. Oh, yeah, I didn't even mean to. That's um, I, I These are just the only small cups that I have right now. We all know. We all knew. We all knew you were planning it. Hey, how, are you excited to read Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Parenti? Well, yeah, well, I already read the um, first chapter, so it was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I don't know how much really I'll have to offer um, interesting to say outside of what is in the text, because it's pretty good and also pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, I asked everybody if they're wearing red in the chat, and Gabriel's like, it's anarchist black, I swear. <laughs> mm. We'll see. Um, Desmond, Desmond's giving you the stink eye right now over there in Italy, the homeland of black shirts. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look, I'm wearing, look I'm wearing red, too. Did I'm you find like an, a, a, a mask for beards? Is that like a beard mask? Yes. Yes. Th that's incredible. Look at the free market uh, just just solving all the problems. Just, <laughs> yeah, if you take if you do a search for uh, beard masks, um, you get a lot of really silly results. Um, and then some that just open a little bit bigger and those work <sighs> for me. You got to love so. Got to love the uh, the market, the invisible hand of the free market. Just and everything rocking, it, just rocking that all... <laughs> that baby crib back and forth. That's actually our transition to the, some of the themes we'll be discussing throughout the reading okay. of this book, because what we learn uh, from Parenti's analysis, I'll go ahead and give you a little spoiler here. There is a class character to fascism, and it comes in heavily on the side of the bourgeoisie. So that's oh. kind of like. The, the main idea, I guess, that we will be exploring throughout the reading of this book. This is a pretty long book. It's 165 pages in the in the print version. It's quite a bit mm -hmm. longer than the Communist Manifesto, but I also think we'll get through it pretty quick because it's a lot, like, unlike the Communist Manifesto, it's much more, like, modern language. The ideas are pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of interpretation, interpretation necessary. So we will be stopping occasionally and... and discussing uh but you know it's the, the the there's not a lot of um heavy theory here it's all just basically like history and then a little interpretation and the facts kind of speak for themselves i think for the most part so um i haven't read it cover to cover in a couple of years now so i did i have been reading like some of my bookmarked pages and stuff to try to refresh my memory a little bit but it is a great great book and if you're watching i hope you uh are prepared. There's a lot of history in here that you might not be aware of, by the way. Uh, oh yeah, not... yeah. No, I was. I mean, I was. I was surprised by some of the things. There were some things that were, you know, I think that most people know these days. But um, mm -hmm. there were some interesting. Well, this was written I... in 1997, so at that time, I think it was very much like much less well known. The internet was kind of like fledgling, and there certainly wasn't the information sharing going on that we have today. But I mean, yeah, it's like a lot of this history is like intentionally not taught to us uh, because it's so damning of bourgeois states in general and uh, the role that like the USA played in fascism, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the United Nations, I don't know. I don't think they get into that in chapter one, but there is a lot of uh, harrowing information in this book. Um, Desmond, we, uh, we trust you. We trust that you're wearing a red sweatshirt. And is that like a little mouse with an eye patch, or is that a pig with an eye patch? What is that creature? Oh, I like it. <coughs> mm, whatever is it, it a might chinchilla. Be. Oh, every time I think about chinchillas, I think about wet pets. What? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. What is wet a pets? wet pet? It, it was a it was a meme with specifically with uh, small business local commercial producers in like the mid 2000s only one place where fish and lizards hang out with cats and chinchillas <laughs> and hamsters and frogs and pollywogs 
W E T P E T S. Wet Pets San Pablo. Actually, when I went to Oakland, I went to San Pablo and <laughs> I saw the former site of Wet Pets and it was like a a mecca for me. Nobody knows what I'm talking about at all. I completely alienated the audience. That's okay. Go look it up, <laughs> Wet Pets on YouTube. Go look it up Greatest on local commercial of all time. All right. Literally nobody's what I'm talking about. Okay. So anyway, let's um as, that's a perfect introduction to the book. Black shirts and reds. <clears throat> I think it's pretty good. By Miguel Paranti. Black shirts and reds. So dramatic. All right. Stop bragging. <laughs> he wrote a bunch of books. We get it. Rational fascism and the overthrow of communism. So one of the themes also is just that fascism exists almost as sort of an antibody for capitalism against socialism. Good God. All right, I, can we skip? I think we could skip the acknowledgments, don't you think? They, yeah. Yeah. Pretty's very thankful. <clears throat> we get it. <clears throat> to the Reds and others, nameless heroes, many who resisted yesterday's black shirts and who continue to fight today's ruthless corporate stuffed shirts, and to the memory of Sean Gervasi and Max Gundy, valued friends and warriors of social justice. Oh, so this is a social justice warrior book. <laughs> I see where we go. Uh. For him who knows only your color red flag, you must really exist so he may exist. You who already achieved many bourgeois and working class glories, you became you become a rag again in the poorest way view. Pier Paolo Pasolini. How do you interpret that poem? Did you know you were going to do know. poetry interpretation? Honestly, no, I, yeah, I didn't even <laughs> listen to what you were saying or read it because I was trying to figure out how the best way would be to um, look at this text and also keep an eye on uh, the stream at the same time. Um, but maybe I'll just read it from uh, the screen that I can see on our display. Can you read it? Is, it, is it legible? I can make it yeah, a little bigger for it, you. I got to make oh, it big. Oh, I got to make my own window big. <clears throat> that is good. Bigger than it was before. It's That's good. You know that I one? like it. All right. No. What? All right. Interpret this poem quickly. Mm. Audience, how do you interpret this poem? Well, you see, so for him who knows only your color, red flag. Who's him? Who's he? Well, we're getting to that. You must really oh, okay. exist so he may exist. Uh huh. Um, so what he's saying is that you who already have achieved many bourgeois and working class glories, you become a rag again and the poorest wave you. So, oh, him is the fl no, the flag. This is like a we're addressing the red flag. Right. Yes. 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 The, the um, red flag is the um, subject of this sentence. You. They're you are the red flag. He, yeah, he's addressing the red flag. So he's saying. Right. So the reader um, is the red flag. No, 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 no. So no. for the reader, the reader is addressing the red flag. They say red flag for for all y'all oh, who just, only know your color. Hmm. The writer is addressing the red flag, and the reader is reading it. Yeah, I know. I know how to. I know how this works. So it's a second person and narrative, theory. and the second person is you, the flag. See, Gabriel is with me. Gabriel is the red flag. You is the red flag. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Gabriel's is, not the red yeah, flag unless is Gabriel is flag. you. Yeah, and him is only when Gabriel uh, is reading this poem is Gabriel the red flag. Okay, I'm glad. And him is the re him is the reader. Well, I think him hmm. could be an impersonal. Uh, uh, you know, a, a person. Him could be object. anyone. Him could be anyone yeah. that ever wants to wave that flag. Or who only knows the color red. Right. All right. right. Pier Paolo Pasolini, you are a brilliant <laughs> poet. And the si the, the best evidence of that is that we cannot interpret your poetry. The, the hallmark of the greatest <laughs> poem. Well, All right. you know, I think there's still, uh, maybe he's saying there's still utility in... Um, even a broken red flag. <clears throat> I don't know. Let's go on. I didn't get Let's the part about on. the bourgeoisie, but I'm over it. But nobody said that we were excellent poetry and analysts, okay? It's never been the claim here. Well, I think it would probably read better in the um, Italian, which I do not know. Yeah, the original Italian was probably much yeah. more. It's probably uh, had a lot more clarity. This is a translation issue more than anything. Yeah, I think so, so too. Why, how are you assuming that it's originally in Italian, by the way? That's a little bit 
presumptuous. Isn't it in Maybe Italian Paolo right speaks English. It? Oh, great. I got to go all the way through the contents again. No, I just mean like it's literally right above it, isn't it? I don't I know. think there were two lines Italian. in Italian. Oh, I see. Maybe it's a bilingual poem. Desmond, you we know, need your I help think there's a, I, think, <laughs> I think there's a lot we don't know. <laughs> Desmond knows a lot more than we do. Pasolini was not just a poet, and unfortunately, he has had a bad end. That's not good. Oh, well. Well, we're, I'm, I didn't mean to make fun of you, Pierre Pasolini. I don't know anything about you. In fact, it's a great poem. We're just we're just memeing here. It's They're just in Italian. Know, it's just an Italian, yeah. Wow, this is so. This is already such a complex, rich tapestry we're weaving. Yeah, I mean, All I right. think it ties in nicely to the fact that I ate an Italian sub before uh, we you got did. on stream. You did. <laughs> I didn't even do that on purpose either. I saw it. I saw the evidence of that. I ate a pizza a few days ago. <laughs> what are we doing? What are we talking about? All right, let's read this freaking book. Yeah, what? Whose Jesus stream Christ. is this? <laughs> what is going on? You can't bring up Italian food and stay on the rails. All right, here we go. This book invites those immersed in the prevailing you orthodoxy. Scroll. Of... <clears throat> scroll what? You don't see it? No. I, I oh, my you God. You the... know what? Screen, <laughs> screen, no, listen, slop. I swear, screen sharing has been glitching out on StreamYard lately. Yeah. I've been having this problem a lot. Is it? Do you see it now? Oh, yeah. No. No. Yeah, I mean, I will agree that the past couple of streams that I've watched of yours have been pretty painful with this. but um... Because the because StreamYard's, like, got problems. I swear. Oh, I because see, now it's got the connection to the table, so i got to refresh my freaking browser. So, one second. Okay, cool. Well, so, um, thank you all for uh, joining us today and uh, listening to us uh just read a book out loud the story time it's it's horribly horribly obnoxious i'm gonna email them about this with a sternly worded email you should you should All write right. them you should type <clears throat> up a letter on a typewriter and mail it to them gabriel That'll says get their that pasolini meant that the bourgeois have used the red flag for their own glories mm -hmm. which that's that makes sense to me yeah. i'm literally just um memeing because i i'm bad at st at analyzing poetry and I don't want to admit it. So I'm pretending that the problems with the poem. So if in case that wasn't clear to I, I hopefully that was clear to everybody. All right. <clears throat> Preface. You want me to take this it? You can see it now, right? Slop. Yeah. Yeah, I can see this. All right. Yeah. Give her a read. Preface. This book invites those immersed in the prevailing orthodoxy of democratic social or democratic capitalism to entertain iconoclastic views, to question the shibboleths of free market mythology and the persistence of both right and left anti-communism, and to consider anew with a receptive but not uncritical mind the historic efforts of the much maligned Reds and other revolutionaries. You want to just do like, what does this switch off like every page? Yeah. All right. The political orthodoxy that demonizes communism permeates the entire political perspective. Even people on the left have internalized the liberal conservative ideology that equates fascism and communism as equally evil totalitarian twins. Horseshoe theory, if you will. Two major mass movements of the 20th century. This book attempts to show the enormous differences between fascism and communism, both past and present, both in theory and practice, especially in regard to questions of social equality, private capital accumulation, and class interest. The orthodox mythology also would have us believe that the Western democracies with the United States leading the way have opposed both totalitarian systems with equal, have opposed both totalitarian systems, have opposed both totalitarian systems with equal vigor. In fact, U.S. leaders have been dedicated above all to making the world safe for global corporate investment and the private profit system. Pursuant of this goal, they have used fascism to protect capitalism while claiming to be saving democracy from communism. In the pages ahead, I discuss how capitalism propagates and profits from fascism, the value of revolution and the advancement of the human condition, the causes and effects of the destruction of communism, the continuing relevance of Marxism and class analysis, and the heartless nature of corporate class power. Over a century ago, in his great work Les Miserables, Victor Hugo asked, will the future arrive? He was thinking of a future of social justice free from the terrible shadows of oppression imposed by the few upon imposed by the few upon the great mass of humankind. Of late, some scribes have announced the end of history. With the overthrow of communism, the monumental struggle between alternative systems has ended. They say, 
Capitalism's victory is total. No great transformations are in the offing. The global free market is here to stay. What you see is what you are going to get now and always. This time, the class struggle is definitely over, so Hugo's question is answered. The future has indeed arrived, though not the one he had hoped for. Do you remember in the 90s the whole, like, end of history? I do. Like, uh, the, the, that, like, narrative that was being spun? Like After the just, fall of the like, Soviet Union and all? Like, very briefly. Like, it wasn't something I really gave much thought to because it sounded kind of silly. <clears throat> well, yeah, you were uh, more developed than I was at the time. I, I remember Re Rush Limbaugh and um, mm -hmm. a lot of conservatives talked about it a lot. You know, basically the Soviet Union was over and humanity will just march forward now, progressing forever, and the USA will spread democracy all around the world. And that's the future mm -hmm. of humanity. Basically, I was actually kind of bummed out about it at the time. I, I did a video about this a while back, but like when I was a kid, I was kind of like sad because I thought all the exciting history, which, you know, for like me as a indoctrinated kid meant war. <laughs> I thought like World War II's over, everything, all the cool yeah. stuff's over and <clears throat> it's going to be boring from now on. It's just going to be peaceful and boring. Boy, was I wrong. May you live in interesting times, Slop. Um, yeah. I think it's really funny that the... I love our chat. They're just continuing to analyze the, the poem. <laughs> Maybe we should just do a poetry <laughs> stream. This seems to be... The poetry seems to be the real crowd pleaser here. Uh, <laughs> submit I mean, your communist and anarchist poetry to uh, Works in Theory, and we will give them a read. Well, maybe we should create a segment uh, for this stream yeah. specifically. Maybe like poetry a corner. intermission. Yeah, poetry corner right in the middle. Poetry interpretation corner. That's a good idea. <clears throat> keep the keep Write the it in the show hooked. notes. Because they Do love we have it. show They're... notes? Mm, I have show notes for other shows. I, could, I can write it in those notes. <laughs> Okay. Ah, oh, Lord have mercy. Okay, back to the sh back to the reading. So yeah, but I mean, basically, I do remember living through this uh, this perception of um, the end of history and you know liberal bourgeois democracy. They didn't call it bourgeois democracy, but you know the USA is going to liberate the world. So I know very well. And this book was written in '97, so I have a I'm old enough to remember this uh, this rhetoric. <clears throat> This intellectually anemic end of history theory was hailed as a brilliant exegesis, ex, exegesis? Exegesis. Exeg, exegesis and accorded a generous reception by commentators and reviewers of the corporate controlled media. It served the official worldview perfectly well, saying that the higher circles had been telling us for uh, saying what the higher circles had been telling us for generations, that the struggle between classes is not an everyday reality, but an outdated notion that an untrammeled mm. capitalism is here to stay now and forever that the future belongs to those who control the present. But the Thank question God. we really... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we're saved. Hooray. Capitalism forever. But the question we really should be asking is, do we have a future at all? More than ever, with the planet itself at stake, and boy, was that ahead of its time, it becomes necessary to impose a reality check on those who would plunder our limited ecological resources in the pursuit of limitless profits, those who would squander away our birth rate and extinguish our liberties in their uncompromising pursuit of self-gain. History teaches us that all ruling elites try to portray themselves as the natural and durable social order, even ones that are in serious crisis, that threaten to devour their environmental base in order to continually recreate their hierarchical structure of power and privilege, and all ruling elites are scornful and intolerant of alternative viewpoints. What was that chat you just put up? Oh, it was just a funny and good idea. We should call the poetry corner the poetic justice. <laughs> poetic justice. I love it. I love it. I do. I, do it. It's greenlit. Green light. <clears throat> Truth is an uncomfortable venue for those who pretend to serve our society while in fact serving only themselves at our expense. I hope this effort will chip away at the big lie. <laughs> The truth may not set us free, as the Bible claims, but it is an important first step in that direction. Ooh, well, Michael Parenti promised iconoclasm, and iconoclasm we get. <laughs> Michael Parenti yeah. officially saying the Bible is wrong. <laughs> uh. my, my mom would not like that line. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say the same. All right, chapter one, rational fascism. 
While walking through New York's Little Italy, I passed a novelty shop that displayed posters and t-shirts of Benito Mussolini giving the fashion salute. When I entered the shop and asked the clerk why such items are being offered, he replied, I can only imagine this in, have you ever heard Michael right. Brenny speak? No, I haven't. <clears throat> it's like, just like a Brooklyn Italian, like blue collar. It's just, it's like such a great voice, but I can just hear him saying it. Like when I entered the shop and asked, the, I can't do it, but anyway, and asked the clerk why such <laughs> items were being offered. Well, it's just, I'm imagining Michael Perini. Like if you've ever seen Michael Perini speak, it's like, I, he's like such a New Yorker. Like I'm imagining him walking into the shop and like saying this, like confronting, like in a very, you know, like confrontational <laughs> yeah. New Yorker way, like my dad would. Uh, when I entered the shop and asked the clerk why such items were being offered, he replied, well, some people like them. And, you know, maybe we need someone like Mussolini in this country. <clears throat> well, I bet that shop owner was really happy to have Trump uh, come into the picture. Uh, his comment was a reminder that fascism survives as something more than a historical curiosity. Worse than posters or t-shirts are the works by various writers bent on explaining Hitler or reevaluating Franco or another way sanitizing fascist history. In Italy, during the 1970s, there emerged a veritable cottage industry of books and articles claiming that Mussolini not only made the trains run on time, but also made Italy work well. All these publications, along with many conventional academic studies, have one thing in common. They say little, if anything, about the class policies of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. How do these regimes deal with social services, taxes, business, and the conditions of labor? For whose benefit and at whose expense? Most of the literature on fascism and Nazism does not tell us. Plutocrats choose autocrats. Let us begin with a look at fascism's founder. Born in 1883, the son of a blacksmith, Benito Mussolini's early manhood was marked by street brawls, arrests, jailings, and violent radical political activities. Before World War I, Mussolini was a socialist. A brilliant organizer, agitator, and gifted journalist, he became editor of the Socialist Party's official newspaper. Yet many of his comrades suspected him of being less interested in advancing socialism than in advancing himself. Indeed, when the Italian upper class treated him with recognition, financial support, and the promise of power, he did not hesitate to switch sides. And this is what's really frightening, you know, because this is not a you know, a, a, an isolated story. There, there are a lot of instances of um, socialists becoming fascists or socialist movements turning to fasc towards fascism. Um, <clears throat> if you read the book Red Saxony, it's a it's an academic book, so it's like pretty dry, but it's real. I read it when I was in college because uh, I took a really interesting. I feel like I've seen course. that like being referenced multiple times today, and I, I'm really? not familiar with it. Oh, yeah, it's, just, it's an academic book, it. and it's actually, it's very expensive, too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <laughs> I think it's like over 100 bucks, so most people probably can't. Maybe it's on 3Lib or something? I don't know. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, they, they had this whole, they had this term for, like, the beefsteak Nazis, who were, like, former communists who became Nazis. Um, <clears throat> it, it, you know, it's not, it's certainly not unheard of, and, and, you know, I think a lot of opportunists come into socialism, and then use it to like build their own kind of like fascistic movements within socialism, which is certainly what Mussolini did. And Mussolini was like the prototypical fascist. So, um, oh yeah, LaRouche had a similar trajectory. I've just recently been reading about LaRouche. Have you ever heard of LaRouche, Slop? No, no, I haven't. <clears throat> I don't know much about LaRouche, so I don't really feel comfortable speaking on it much, but um, I think it was like back in the seventies, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he kind of created this like, Oh, it was in the 60s, 60s and 70s, created a um, like this really weird, like psyop COINTELPRO kind of thing where he was like trying to co-opt socialism in the USA. And uh, you can look up Operation Mop Up if you want to learn more about that. I'm still studying it, so I can't okay. speak to it too intelligently. But um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of situations like this have happened over time. Um, and as we will learn, the fascist intentionally tried to co-opt the rhetoric and aesthetics and such of um, socialism because it was so popular, especially in the early 20th century. You know, socialism and communism was incredibly popular in the USA, throughout Europe. So the fascists like intentionally co-opted aesthetics and elements of socialism to try to, uh, you know, pull in wor the working class into the fascist circles. So anyway, getting out of ourselves. Uh, by the end of World War I, Mussolini the socialist who had organized strikes for workers and peasants had become Mussolini the fascist who broke strikes on behalf of financiers and landowners. 
Using the huge sums he received from wealthy interests, he projected himself onto the national scene as the acknowledged leader of I Fasci di Combattimento. Uh, sorry, sorry, Desmond, I'm sure I butchered that <laughs> Italian pronunciation. <laughs> Uh, a movement composed of black-shirted ex-army officers and sundry toughs who were guided by no clear political doctrine other than a militaristic patriotism and conservative dislike for anything associated with socialism and organized labor. The fascist black shirts spent their time attacking trade unionists, socialists, communists, and farm cooperatives. And this is so important to understand about the origins of fascism. <laughs> they got their start basically being paid off by capitalists to bust strikes, brawl with unionists, and just attack socialists and communists and anarchists uh, in Italy and Germany, everywhere that's ever kind of like become a powerful movement. They always get started as anti-communists. So um, at least in this, uh, in this, you know, early period of fascism. Um, okay. Take it away, Slop. After World War I, Italy had settled into a pattern of parliamentary democracy. The low pay scales were improving and the trains were already running on time. But the capitalist economy was in a post-war recession. Investments stagnated, heavy industry operated far below capacity, and corporate profits and agribusiness exports were declining. To maintain profit levels, the large landowners and industrialists would have to slash wages and raise prices. The state, in turn, would have to provide them with massive subsidies and tax exemptions. To finance this corporate welfareism, the populace would have to be taxed more heavily, and social services and welfare expenditures would have to be drastically cut. Measures that might sound familiar to us today. Austerity! Yay! You want to pick it up from here? Sure. But the government was not completely free to pursue this course. By 1921, many Italian workers and peasants were unionized and had their own political organizations. With demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, factory takeovers, and the forcible occupation of farmlands, they had won the right to organize along with concessions in wages and work conditions. To impose a full measure of austerity, look at that. I predicted that word. I'm so good at analysis. <laughs> Actually, I probably just, uh, I think I read this like yesterday, so <laughs> I probably just remembered it. <laughs> To impose a full measure of austerity upon workers and peasants, the ruling economic interests would have to abolish the democratic rights that helped the masses defend their modest living standards. The socialism was to smash their unions, political organizations. Oh, sorry, the solution was to smash their unions, political organizations, <laughs> and civil liberties. Industrialists and big landowners wanted someone at the helm who could break the power of organized workers and farm laborers and impose a stern order on the masses. For this task, Benito Mussolini, armed with his gangs of black shirts, seemed the likely candidate. This is something I remember <clears throat> my professor, the late, great Dr. Hartstein, um, who's, who was one of the foremost experts on fascism and somehow worked at the University of South Carolina. But um, he talked about this a lot when I was taking that, uh, this, this class with him. Um, <clears throat> basically, there's this pattern where, fascism take, where fascists take power, where the bourgeoisie liberals usually, um, <clears throat> or, you know, and or conservatives, uh, who really are kind of like one entity. <clears throat> the bourgeoisie gets fearful of socialism and communism. And so do the like petty bourgeoisie and the upper middle class who have like class, who have interests in maintaining capitalism, um, privilege and that sort of thing. They, they see cap communism and socialism. They, uh, get scared of it because they don't want to have a revolution. They want things to stay the way they are. They want to preserve their privilege. And they realize that like, it's going to take getting your hands dirty to stop this, these massive socialist movements. But they're like, they don't want to get their hands dirty directly. They're kind of wishy-washy about violence directly. You know, they don't want to directly get involved with that. So they see the fascists as like dupes, you know, like useful idiot kind of thing where they think they can, uh, put the fascists in charge, have the fascists, you know, mop up the um, communism and socialism, put, put that all to bed. And then they always have this idea that they'll just take the power back afterwards because they see the fascists as like incompetent, easy to manipulate, you know, et cetera, et cetera, not too savvy. That's what happened in, in, uh, with the Italians uh, in, in Mussolini. That's what happened with the Germans in Hitler. That's what happened with uh, uh, Franco in Spain. Um, and then what happens is the fascists hold on to their power. They never give it up willingly. And then they usually like drive everything into com calamity. <laughs> and then, uh, finally some circumstances will eventually, you know, dismantle the fascism partially as we'll see later in this book. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing we see throughout, throughout, that's another pattern we see throughout history that, that, uh, 
Parenti is touching on here. Um, did I finish reading this page? Yeah, yeah, you did a good job. Okay, all right, it's your turn. <clears throat> In 1922, the Federazione Industriale, composed of the leaders of industry, along with representatives from the banking and agribusiness associations, met with Mussolini to plan the March on Rome, contributing 20 million lira to the undertaking. With the additional backing of Italy's top military officers and police chiefs, the fascist revolution, really a coup d'etat, took place. Within two years after seizing state power, Mussolini had shut down all opposition newspapers and crushed the socialist, liberal, Catholic, Democratic, and Republican parties, which together had commanded some 80% of the vote. Ooh. Labor leaders, peasant leaders, parliamentary delegates, and others critical of the new regime were beaten, exiled, or murdered by fascist terror squadristi. The Italian Communist Party endured the se severest repression of all, yet managed to maintain a courageous underground resistance that eventually evolved into armed struggle against the black shirts and the German occupation force. Um, in Germ and again, this is another thing you'll see. The people who were like most organized to resist fascism all around the world, anytime it's ever come up, have always been the communists. Uh, the communists are the anti-fascists, especially of like the early to mid 20th century, but you know, continuing to today, um, I include, you know, uh, anarcho-communists have been have been involved in this as, as well. Um, so, you know, there are various strains of communism that have cropped up to oppose fascism. But, you know, it's always been the anti-capitalists that have been the anti-fascists. And the people who have been most complicit with fascism, as this book will document again and again, have been the pro-capitalist bourgeoisie and the liberals and the neoliberals and that sort of thing. Uh, they either are complicit or overtly facilitate fascism. So, um Spoiler, war spoiler, spoiler warning, that's what this book is going to get into <laughs> later on. <clears throat> in Germany, a similar, pa similar pattern of complicity between fascists and capitalists emerged. German workers and farm laborers had won the right to unionize the eight-hour day and unemployment insurance. <clears throat> but to revive profit levels, heavy industry and big finance wanted wage cuts for their workers and massive state subsidies and tax cuts for themselves. During the 1920s, the Nazi Sturmabteilung, or SA, S S A, I guess you'd say in English. <laughs> I I got used to saying I, that because of that class. I did. Yeah, that's good. The brown-shirted stormtroopers, subsidized by businesses, were used mostly as an anti-labor paramilitary force, whose function was to terrorize workers and farm laborers. Now, this, I, I yeah, this was a big thing. And again, in Saxony, where the communism was like really, really strong, and that's a region in Germany. Um, this happened a lot. Where, where fascists were being like trucked in to just go like beat the shit out of communists and unionists, especially if they were trying to strike or demand, you know, higher wages or whatever. Um, that, like, yeah, I so guess what was like, I guess like one thing that I wonder is like, what was the uh, messaging like during that? Like what, were, like what was the um, reason given uh, for like busting up uh, you know, unions and uh, everything. Back well, then. It, it would depend on, you know, the specific form fascism was taking. But like in Germany, you know, there was the whole Bolshevism is a Jewish conspiracy and the Bolsheviks were um, working. You know, you know, they had this big conspiracy theory yeah, in Germany. And about... he, he goes into this later in the chapter, too, now that I remember. <clears throat> yeah. But it just yeah, just to finish the thought, like the, there was this big conspiracy theory that the fascists pushed that the Bolsheviks and Jewish people and, you know, all these different like groups that they opposed worked to, secretly to end the war and to, to surrender in World War One, even though they were winning. This is like the mythology that they were pushing. It was like they, they were betrayed. And so a lot of the veterans were were being fed this bullshit that they only lost World War One because the communists and the Jews, who were actually one big entity, uh, betrayed the German people and like surrendered and blah, 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 blah. So that was a big part of it. And just feeding like the idea that communism is like um, anti-German in in Germany. I'm more familiar right. with the German version of it. I don't. I, I, I'm sure Italy used. I'm sure Mussolini used similar kind of talking points. Although they, I don't think they were quite as. Um, they didn't use anti-Semitism quite as prominently. Uh, although they did definitely have anti-Semitism in, in Mussolini's uh, circles as well. But um, yeah. So anyway, okay. Um, <clears throat> in Germany, did I read this already? In Germany, a similar yeah, kind yeah, of complicity. Yeah. I did. I think you actually finished I read the whole the, thing. 
Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, Start on the last sentence. They greatly increased. Yeah, by 1930, most of the tycoons yeah. had concluded that the Weimar Republic no longer served their interests and was too accommodating to the working class. Uh, they greatly increased their subsidies to Hitler, propelling the Nazi party onto the national stage. Business tycoons supplied the Nazis with generous funds for fleets of motor cars and loudspeakers to saturate the cities and villages of Germany, along with funds for Nazi party organizations, youth groups, and paramilitary forces. In the July 1932 campaign, Hitler had sufficient funds to fly to 50 cities in the last two weeks alone. In that same campaign, the Nazis received 37.3% of the vote, the highest they ever won in a democratic national election. They never had a majority of the people on their side. To the extent that they had any kind of reliable base, it generally was among the more affluent members of society. That's the other thing, too, um, that are, I'm just remembering this from my studies in, you know, back in college. But, like, the other thing is that a lot of, the, you know, it wasn't like a majority of workers were joining the fascists, right? It was a minority. Right. And these were people who, I mean, you know, there is this, like, um, not to get too armchair psychologists or whatever, but after things like war and, you know, especially World War One was this really traumatic experience. And a lot of these soldiers were kind of, like, dumped out without a lot of uh, social safety nets, and their identity was very strongly tied in with, like, the military and nationalism, and they didn't have... They wanted, like, a place to belong, and they wanted to have that camaraderie they had in the military, and the fascists definitely preyed on that a lot. And so you had a lot of these veterans that were treated badly after the war in terms of not getting, like, uh, compensated for their service well, they're, a lot of them were like either homeless or on the verge of homelessness, living in these like big barracks and that sort of thing. They were not happy with the way things were going. And a lot of them had, you know, they were like just violent thugs. Uh, they were violent, you know, brawler types. And the fascists recruited these people specifically to be brown shirts because they just like to go out and fight and brawl in beer halls and bash unionists and that sort of thing. So it was a small minority of dejected people who had been scarred by the war and were vulnerable and easy to recruit, basically, into this kind of fascist force, which you definitely still see to this day with fascists. I mean, fascists still definitely recruit people who are vulnerable and sort of, like, alienated in society and that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of one of the patterns we see here. And I guess you can pick it up, Slop. Okay. <clears throat> and there's a little hiss growing on your side. Oh. Fix it. Yep. Okay, that usually does. Thanks. Uh... Or did we leave off? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think in the They never had campaign, a majority. No, no. Uh, in the same campaign, the Nazis received 37.3. Yeah, this is right. We read that. But in the same okay. campaign, okay. They never had a majority of the people on their side. To the extent that they had any kind of reliable base, it generally was among the more affluent members of society. Right, we did read that. <laughs> uh, in addition, elements of the, of the uh, petty bourgeoisie and many lumpen proletariats served a strong arm party of thugs, organized into the SA stormtroopers, but the great majority of the organized working class supported the communist or social Democrats to the very end. Mm -hmm. And in the December 1932 election, three candidates ran for president, the conservative incumbent field marshal von Hindenburg, the Nazi candidate who would have been like the conservative, you know, he was literally like aristocracy, the Nazi candidate, Adolf Hitler and the communist party candidate, Ernst Teilmann. In his campaign, Talman argued that a vote for Hindenburg amounted to a vote for Hitler and that Hitler would lead Germany into war because the fascists and the conservatives and the bourgeoisie were working together so clearly, uh, and it was just obvious. The bourgeois press, including the Social Democrats, denounced this view as a Moscow-inspired. So you see the bourgeois uh, elements backing, basically, uh, Hindenburg and Hitler as like a unit. <clears throat> Hindenburg was re-elected while the Nazis dropped approximately 2 million votes in the Reichstag election as compared to their peak of over 13.7 million. So you could see, again, the fascists were not super popular. They were just very aggressive, very loud, very violent, and, you know, just kind of like coerced their way into power. Uh, true to form, the Social Democrat leaders refused the Communist Party's proposal to form an 11th hour coalition against Nazism. This is really important. So they had this opportunity. Oh, I see you highlighted it. <laughs> yeah, I did. I probably highlighted this two years ago. True to form, yeah. So, so they, they, um, the Social Democrats could have allied with the Communists to form a coalition against Hindenburg and Hitler, but they refused because they were like anti-communist, right? The, the, the Sockdem, basically the liberals of Germany, 
were like, no, we're not going to work with the communists. <clears throat> and that's what, you know, led Hindenburg and, and Hitler into power. Uh, as in many other countries past and present, so as in Germany, the Social Democrats would sooner ally themselves with the reactionary right than make common cause with the Reds. And this is what I refer to as the liberal fascist bargain that we see time and time and time again, where liberals and sock dems and you know, social conservatives and whatnot, they are very willing to play ball with fascism anytime the red scare, the red threat shows up, anytime communism rears its ugly head. Uh, meanwhile, a number of right-wing parties coalesced behind the Nazis, and in January 1933, just weeks after the election, Hindenburg invited Hitler to become chancellor. Upon assuming state power, Hitler and his Nazis pursued a political economic agenda not unlike Mussolini's. They crushed organized labor and eradicated all elections, opposing parties or opposition parties and independent publications. <clears throat> Hundreds of thousands of opponents were imprisoned, tortured or murdered. In Germany, as in Italy, the communists endured the severest political repression of all groups. Here were two peoples, the Italians and Germans, with different histories, cultures, and languages, and supposedly different temperaments, who ended up with the same repressive solutions because of the compelling similarities of economic power and class conflict that prevailed in their respective countries. In such diverse countries as Lithuania, Croatia, Romania, Hungary, and Spain, a similar fascist pattern emerged to do its utmost to save big capital from the impositions of democracy. And this, you know, again, you see whenever uh, Allende is dem democratically elected, um, the bourgeois don't like the results of the election, so they install Pinochet, often with the help of a neoliberal uh, puppet master country like the USA or England or France. There's lots of countries that do that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, this was happening from the very beginning of fascism. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Gabriel says in the chat, scratch a liberal and a fascist bleeds. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, liberals are just nice fascists. <laughs> hey, hey, BP, how you doing? Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, Everyone BP. make sure you, you tune in to, uh, me and, P, me and BP do a show every week called The Dialectic every, uh, Wednesday night at, uh, it starts at 10 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you tune in for that. How you doing, BP? That's absolutely correct, though. The, you know, the liberals and the, and the fascists, they play together. I mean, if you look here in Vietnam where I live, the fascists of the no regime, the Southern puppet regime were installed by liberals, you know, and, and kept in power by liberals. So like uh, it's, it's all around the world throughout the 20th and 21st century, you see this liberal fascist bargain going on. And that's exactly what we're discussing right here. Um, whom just did the fascists support? Mm. There is a vast literature on who supported the Nazis, but relatively little on whom the Nazis supported after they came to power. This is in keeping with the tendency of conventional scholarship to avoid the entire subject of capitalism whenever something unfavorable might be said about it. Capitalist, hegemonic uh, propaganda, Dece de 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 deceit, omission effect. That's the nature of bourgeois history. Whose interest did Mussolini, did Mussolini and Hitler support? In both Italy in the 1920s and Germany in the 1930s, old industrial evils thought to have passed permanently into history reemerged as the conditions of labor deteriorated precipitously. In the name of saving society from the red menace, unions and strikes were outlawed. Union property and farm cooperatives were confiscated and handed over to rich private owners. Minimum wage laws, overtime pay, and factory safety regulations were abolished. Speed ups became commonplace. Dismissals or imprisonment awaited those workers who complained about unsafe or inhumane work conditions. Workers toiled longer hours for less pay, the already modest wages severely cut in Germany by 25 to 40 percent. In Italy, by 50 percent. In Italy, child labor was reintroduced. This is why it makes me so pissed, Grant, when yeah. people say that the fascists, the Nazis, were actually socialists. Mm -hmm. It's so absurdly untrue. Well, it's just an antithetical. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the, the fascists so clearly align themselves with the bourgeoisie like that. You know, the 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 Germans, one of the first thing they did was outlaw trade unions and replace them with these. I can't I can't remember what they called them, but it's like these like they called them like worker groups that were controlled directly by the state and they were extremely hierarchical. So like you, you if you were a worker in Germany, when the fascists took power, when the Nazis took power, 
you lost your union that represented your interests democratically, and instead you were put into this uh, German worker group kind of thing, which was supposed to organize all the workers of Germany together. And then the state, the whole idea was, uh, the, the uh, presented idea, I guess you could say, the front mm -hmm. speak, right? Was right. that the state would arbitrate between the working class and the capitalists, right? So that was like what the fascists promised. They said, from now on, you don't have to worry about this anymore, workers. We're going to take care of you. We're going to arbitrate any disputes that the workers have with the capitalists. But what that really meant was completely busting down on unions, driving down wages, driving down working conditions, and creating these really highly uh, hierarchical state-run organizations that completely removed any autonomy that the workers had. And the state worked on behalf of the capitalist interests, like time and time and time again. So the, yeah. the whole claim that the, that the National Socialists were actually socialists, actually communists, is so... It just shows that they've not researched anything about what the National Socialists and the... And the yeah, it's you know, very the uninformed. <clears throat> it's either uninformed or it's just like an intentional distortion of history or some combination right. of the two. So, so there you go. Um, <clears throat> To be sure, a few crumbs were thrown to the populace. There were free concerts and sporting events, some meager social programs, a dole for the unemployed, financed mostly by contributions from working people, and showy public works projects designed to evoke civic pride. Take it away, Slop. Man, well, I got I got something to say about oh, that. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's been like a lot of talk recently about like um this uh like public service loan forgiveness program. Uh yeah. I mean, here in the U.S., like we're like I feel like I see you know like an article about it every day, or like somebody like like bringing it up, talking about it. And I ran the numbers um, on my own student loans, um, mm -hmm. and because you know now I I, I I don't I mean nobody knows this, but I, I have a public service job, and uh, I thought okay, I could apply to this and actually like maybe get my student loans forgiven. But the fact is, I have to make a hundred payments, hundred qualified payments. Uh, which <laughs> in order to get my student loans forgiven, which once I'd make a hundred payments, um, it's roughly equal to, uh, the initial loan that I took out. So, wow. Um, wow. Cool. What a scam. Thanks guys. Like really patting yourselves on the back. And, uh, like I'm very, uh, grateful, uh, for that. Wow. Jesus Christ. What so a scam. anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so. For instance, I mean, like liberals and I mean, like everyone's like excited about, you know, having their student loans forgiven. Uh, so they just like jump at anything. But it's like this is what they're offering. This is not any yeah, kind of solution. Just, uh, well, yeah, and the working class, of course. Um, and before, and the, of course, this was uh, these economies that existed in the early 20th century. They were before like modern monetary theory would apply. They were before there was like a fiat currency. So it was like kind of gold standard world. Um so this was a situation where someone had to actually foot the bill for this stuff uh, more so than today, you know? Um, right. Because nowadays, like, there's really no excuse whatsoever for not just, like, giving away free college and free... Because we have the, like, capacity to do that. That's a whole other subject. But, <laughs> you know, back then, they were having to get the gold from somebody to finance this stuff, yeah. theoretically. And um, they were, like, taxing the workers to do it, which is basically what happens today. Only now it's even more of a farce because... You know, working class people pay way more in taxes than the billionaires uh, by percentage. Um, but it's like such a scam because that money, when you pay your taxes, just basically disappears. It just goes into the oblivion because the government finances things through the through the Fed, through just basically creating money out of thin air. And then when you pay your taxes, it just disappears. So this whole right. idea that we have to like pay for these programs doesn't really line up with reality. In reality, you just have to have nowadays, you just have to have like, spare capacity in the economy, which we have so much of right now with COVID and everything, and which we had before COVID even. But anyway, um, I'm definitely the, like going off on a tangent, but but that's what well, they were doing. They the, were, yeah. Oh, good. No, I was just going to say the comment in the chat, the real student loan forgiveness was the friends we made along the way, <laughs> <laughs> which, yeah, actually that is, that is true. Um, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm pretty lucky because I, I, the only real student loans I had, I had some pretty good scholarships. The only real student loans I had to pay off were the ones I used to buy like video games and cameras and stuff because I took out <laughs> yeah, some. Yeah, I remember. Those, like, <laughs> you remember? 
Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm for, I'm very fortunate that my loans are paid off, but um, everyone I know that's our age, like still are paying off your loans. Like, and we're like almost, well, I mean, mine are, mine are fair, mine are fairly new. <clears throat> Cause I got, Oh, yours are from your master's ventures. program or, uh, yeah. I thought you got that motorcycle wreck money to pay for that. Yeah, it turns out that does not pay for a master's degree. <laughs> getting, <laughs> getting almost killed by the motor vehicle does not actually pay your student uh, cost. Sound off in the chat if you're a U.S. American and you're strapped with student debt. I'm sure there's plenty of you. Not to yeah. brag, but I've been paying mine for six years and just barely sub 10000 You're doing better than a lot of people I know that are 40, so yeah. don't feel too I've been badly. paying mine uh, for six years. I'm at like, well... Six times that, but you know. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's so absurd. Why didn't you just go to Europe? It's just not. Don't it's have... just not real anymore. Like I don't even. I know. I don't know. I don't even think about it. It's just like, but that's what they want. That's what they want you to do. That's what they want. They just want it to become completely like capitalist realism. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, you kind of get the idea. If you live in the USA, you have a good idea of what Parenti's talking about in terms of these weak ass <laughs> social programs that the Nazis gave the working class. Um, you want to... Yeah, I can pick up. Yeah, go ahead and pick up. Both Mussolini and Hitler showed their gratitude to their big business patrons by privatizing many perfectly solvent state-owned steel mills, power plants, banks, and steamship companies. Both regimes dipped heavily into the public treasury to refloat or subsidize heavy industry. Agribusiness farming was expanded and heavily subsidized. Both states guaranteed a return on the capital investment by giant corporations while assuming most of the risks and losses on investments. As is often the case with reactionary regimes, public capital was raided by private capital. <sighs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> this is literally yeah. just the USA now. Like, I mean, look, for instance, at the at the vaccines that the yeah. state funded. It's just it blows my mind. The state funded these things and now they're going around and profiteering heavily off of selling them at like exorbitant prices to developing countries. Luna just tweeted about that a while back. Hold on, let me see if I can pull that up just so we, while we're on the subject, because, um, hold on. So like, uh, here we go. Yeah, Moderna. I'll just share this real quick, because it's just, it's it sort of speaks to what we're talking about. Because that's another thing about fascism is that like there are fascistic elements for sure to like neoliberalism. Um, Moderna racing for profits keeps COVID vaccine out of reach of poor. Some poor countries are paying more and waiting longer for the company's vaccine than the wealthy if they even have access at all. And this is not just uh, Moderna, but like lots of companies are doing this. And, you know, this this vaccine was <clears throat> funded with financial aid and scientific support of the U.S. government. This is exactly yeah. what we're talking about. It still goes on right now in the US of A and around the world. And it's so yeah. very gross. And I want to say too, I saw somebody in the chat suggest, I think it was maybe Wilhelm or, uh, or mm -hmm. no, uh, Gabriel uh, actually said it yet. Yeah, or I can't remember, I can't see it now. Oh, Kevin uh, said it. Uh, but yeah, if you uh, or have not gone to college yet uh, and you want to study somewhere, do not go to college in the United States. Go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's you can free swing it at all yeah. in so many places. Yeah, if it's entire if it's impossible at all, uh, talk to your uh, guidance counselor. I guess I don't know. Oh yeah, talk to talking somebody. to the the youngins, the little yeah. ones, the younglings. Uh, <laughs> just talk to somebody <laughs> that knows how to navigate that shit because yeah, it's just not worth it. Well, they don't teach us shit like that. You know, that's the other thing that's really weird. You know, when I when I when I was in college, well, I weird. didn't know how <laughs> I didn't know how master's degrees worked at all, and nobody ever explained it to me. And it was like I was like just about to graduate, and I just assumed that I was going to go to graduate school. Yeah, I just thought like, yeah, it'll be easy. I'll just go to graduate school, and I knew nothing about it. Nobody ever told me anything about it in my entire life. And then I found out it's actually like pretty hard to go to graduate school, and the, like because I thought. <laughs> I thought every school had just like thousands of grad students and it was just like getting a bachelor's degree. Like, you know, you just do it. But then I was like, and, and so I was just like, all right, I'm looking up how you apply. And it was just like, I went, I was trying to apply to all these film programs. And it was like, yes, we accept seven people per year. We accept <laughs> four people per year. And it's like super fucking expensive. And like, it's really competitive. And I was just like, wow, I don't have a portfolio. I don't have. Yeah recommendation i have like nothing like i had i had no clue that any like I, I could have been working on that all through my 
bachelor's degree, but just nobody ever explained it to me. Yeah. I was I, very yeah, my, excited about that. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience. I think I applied to like UGA for a master's in classics or something, and they were just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you they all just nothing. laughed. They basically laughed at me. <laughs> yeah. They just sent me re reply letters that were just like, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're not. Yeah, you're not going here. All right. <clears throat> Little side side stroll, but that's OK. All right. Um, To be sure. Yeah. OK. Yeah, we're in the last paragraph here. To be sure, a few <laughs> crumbs were thrown to the populace. They were free. Oh, uh, wait, we did. Oh, we read, read this. this. We read this, too. What the hell's going on? At the same, At the same time, time, taxes, taxes were yeah. increased. Yeah. At the same time, taxes were increased for the general populace, but lowered or eliminated for the rich and big business. Inheritance taxes on the wealthy were greatly reduced or abolished altogether. Yeah, well, same familiar. old story. Uh, the result of all this, in Italy during the 1930s, the economy was gripped by recession, a staggering public debt, and widespread corruption. But industrial profits rose, and the armaments factories busily rolled out weapons in preparation for the war to come. Wow, that really does sound like the USA right now. <laughs> in Germany, unemployment was cut in half with the considerable expansion in armament jobs, but overall poverty increased because of the drastic wage cuts. Huh. <clears throat> and from 1935 to 1943, industrial profits increased substantially, while the net income of corporate leaders climbed at 46%. <clears throat> During the radical 1930s in the United States, Great Britain, and Scandinavia, upper income groups experienced a modest decline in their share of the national income. But in Germany, the top 5% enjoyed a 15% gain. So again, we I would love, I wish that right now I could talk to some, one of those mini dipshits that have commented <laughs> on my YouTube videos saying, actually, the Nazis were socialists. I really wish that one of them would just like materialize before me right now so we could read this together. <laughs> Despite this record, most writers have ignored fascism's close collaboration with big business. Some even argue that business was not a beneficiary, but a victim of fascism. Oh, of course. Angelo Cotavilla, a, a Hoover Institute conservative scribe. I love the Hoover Institute. My favorite <laughs> Hoover Institute article is the one that writes about how Franklin Delano Roosevelt like intentionally dismantled socialism by like through all these like underhanded means and they act like it was such a wonderful thing he did. The Hoover oh, Institute. Right. It's great. If you want to check out some really interesting conservative propaganda, check out the Hoover Institute. Okay, anyway. <laughs> uh, the Ho Hoover Institute conservative scribe blindly announced if fascism means anything, it means government ownership and control of business. Actually, reading this makes me realize that the Hoover Institute is like the predecessor of PragerU. Because this, oh, this is some PragerU yeah. bullshit we're on right now. If fascism means anything, it means government ownership and control of business. Wah, wah. Thus, fascism is misrepresented <laughs> as a mutant form of socialism. In fact, if fascism means anything, it means all-out government support for business and severe repression of anti-business pro-labor forces. Take it away, slop. Is fascism merely a dictatorial force in the service of capitalism? That may not be all it is, but certainly is an important part of fascism's raison d'etre. How do you say it? Dieter? Raison, <laughs> raison d'etre? Raison, raison d'etre? Man, I took, a, I took French just for pronunciation, and I just I didn't get there. I um, have no clue. Anyway. I'm always just, like, shooting in the dark with French. Well, I, I mean, I quit going to the class after five classes anyway, so I guess that's my <laughs> answer. <laughs> uh, the hey, Good Morning says I got it. <laughs> Yeah, you did good. I'm going to go ahead and assume Good Morty is an expert on French and that I am awesome at. <laughs> the function Hitler himself kept referring to when he talked about saving the industrialists and bankers from Bolshevism. It is a subject that deserves far more attention than it has received. <clears throat> While the fascists might have believed they were saving the plutocrats from the Reds, in fact, the revolutionary left was never strong enough to take state power in either Italy or Germany. Which Gramsci wrote about a lot. We should read Gramsci soon. Um, well, popular it's forces, be a while however, if we read this whole thing. <laughs> oh well, we're, we're getting through it at a clip, you know. Yeah, we're doing. I good. think that we're we'll finish. I think we'll finish ten percent of it today, probably. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this frustrated capitalism was attempts to resolve its internal contradiction. Wait, I skipped something, didn't I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, the revolution left. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Popular forces, however, were strong enough to cut into profit rates and interfere with the capital accumulation process. This frustrated capitalism's attempts to resolve its internal contradictions by shifting more and more of its costs onto the backs of the working population. 
Re revolution or no revolution, this democratic working class resistance was troublesome to the moneyed interests. Among, <clears throat> along with serving the capitalists, fascist leaders served themselves, getting in on the money at every opportunity. Their personal greed and their class loyalties were two sides of the same coin. Mussolini and his cohorts lived lavishly, cavorting with the higher circles of wealth and aristocracy. <clears throat> Nazi officials and SS commanders amassed personal fortunes by plundering conquered territories and stealing from concentration camp inmates and other political victims. Huge amounts were made from secretly owned, well-connected businesses and from contracting out camp slave labor to industrial firms like IG Farben and Krupp. And yeah, again, corporations were profiting from the <laughs> concentration camps. What more evidence do you need? I mean, seriously, like the, the, there are so many corporations that exist today, like Bayer, yeah. Krupp, uh, all these all these companies are still making money. Well, we're going to get we're still gonna get to a, making... another. We're going to get to another like list of American uh, corporations. Oh, for too. God's sake! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the best chapters, really, in terms yeah. of like well, no, it's, eye opening it's horseshit. <laughs> oh, is it in this chapter? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's in a couple pages. I think. Oh, yeah, this is the only chapter you read, so I guess I you're an you're an authority <laughs> on this chapter. Yeah. Take it away. Oh, uh, Hitler is usually portrayed as an ideological fanatic, uninterested in crass material things. In fact, he accumulated an immense fortune, much of which, much of it in questionable ways. He expropriated artworks from the public domain. He stole enormous sums from the Nazi party coffers. He invented a new concept, the personality right, that enabled him to charge a small fee for every po postage stamp with his picture on it, a venture that made him hundreds of millions of marks. Uh, this footnote is kind of funny, um, if yeah, I remember correctly, yeah, because bad. it was like Hindenburg said, like he wanted, what was it? Like he, everyone he to he, lick his ass or something. Right. Basically <laughs> he said that he's like, <laughs> he was really excited about having his, so that Hitler could, uh, lick his ass. Yeah. Right, 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 right. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> the greatest source of Hitler's wealth was a secret slush fund to which leading German industrialists regularly donated. Hitler knew that as long as German industry was making money, his private money sources would be inexhaustible. Thus, he'd see to it that German industry was never better off than under his rule by launching, for one thing, gigantic armament projects, or what we today would call fat defense contracts. Far from being the ascetic, Hitler lived self-indulgently. <clears throat> During his entire tenure in office, he got special rulings from the German tax office that allowed him to avoid paying income or property taxes, he had a motor pool of limousines, private apartments, country homes, a vast staff of servants, and a majestic estate in the Alps. His happiest times were spent entertaining European royalty, including the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Good old Duke and Duchess of Windsor, always, always getting into trouble, who, were, who numbered among his enthusiastic admirers. Kudos for Adolf and Benito. <clears throat> Italian fascism and German Nazism had their admirers within the U.S. business community and the corporate-owned press. Bankers, publishers, industrialists, including the likes of Henry Ford, traveled to Rome and Berlin to pay homage, receive medals, and strike profitable deals. Many did their utmost to advance the Nazi war effort, sharing military-industrial secrets and engaging in secret transactions with the Nazi government, even after the United States entered the war. During the 1920s and early 1930s, major publications like Fortune, The Wall Street Journal, Saturday Evening Post, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and Christian Science Monitor hailed Mussolini as the man who rescued Italy from anarchy and radicalism. They spun rhapsodic fantasies of a resurrected Italy where poverty <laughs> and exploitation had suddenly disappeared, where reds had been vanquished, harmony reigned, and black shirts protected a new democracy. So yeah, you're not, you're starting to see the the formation of support for fascists with the liberal plutocracy in the USA and England with the with the Windsors and all these different corporations and newspapers praising Mussolini and Hitler. So um, yeah, this is where we start to get into like really disgusting stuff. Uh, <clears throat> the Italian language press in the United States eagerly joined the chorus. The two most influential newspapers. La Italia of San Francisco, financed largely by AP Gianni, Giannini's Bank of America, and Il Progresso of New York, owned by multimillionaire Generoso Pope, <clears throat> looked favorably on the fascist regime and suggested that the United States could benefit from a similar social order. Some dissenters 
refused to join the We Adore Benito chorus. The nation reminded its readers that Mussolini was not saving democracy, but destroying it. Progressives of all stripes and various labor leaders, <clears throat> again, the labor unions, socialists, communists, and progressives were the anti-communists, <clears throat> but their critical sentiments received little exposure in the U.S. corporate media. As with Mussolini, so with Hitler, the press did not look too unkindly upon their Fuhrer's Nazi dictatorship. There was a strong give Adolf a chance contingent, some of it greased by Nazi money. In exchange for the more positive coverage in the, in the Hearst newspapers, for instance, the Nazis paid almost 10 times the standard subscription rates for Hearst INS wire service. In return, William Randolph Hearst instructed his correspondents in Germany to file friendly reports about Hitler's regime. Those who refused were transferred or fired. Hearst newspapers even opened their pages to occasional guest columns by prominent Nazi leaders like Alfred Rosenberg and Hermann Goering. Now, Hearst was like the big ass, like, like news conglomerate of this period of time. So like, yeah. you know, Hearst backing the Nazis was a huge, huge deal. It was like, uh, just, just like a, they had like a massive, massive footprint in the American media landscape at the time. So <clears throat> that's, a uh, yeah. not to be understated. Um, by the mid to late 1930s, Italy and Germany allied with Japan, another industrial latecomer, were aggressively seeking a share of the world's markets in colonial booty <clears throat> and expressionism and expansionism that brought them increasingly into conflict with more established Western capitalist nations like Great Britain, France, and the United States. As the clouds of war gathered, U.S. press opinion about the Axis powers took on a decisively critical tone. That's another thing to understand about fascism <clears throat> in, in this period of time especially. They were all, they, they tended to be countries that at the time did not have massive colonial empires, but they wanted them. So like there was this famous expression in Germany, which was finally German will have a place in the sun. And they were referring to the global South, basically, like Africa and South Amer America, Asia, these places that were heavily colonized. And, you know, Italy had their adventurism in Ethiopia, which they actually got pretty embarrassed in Ethiopia because um, the, the, the Ethiopian military was not particularly well funded. It was not particularly modernized, but they still like gave the Italian fascist military like which was pretty mechanized and pretty advanced by comparison, uh, you know, a pretty strong run for their money. <clears throat> that was a, if I'm not mistaken, that was Haile Selassie, right? That, that uh, <clears throat> you know, Ras Tafari, uh, yeah, yeah. the, the, was the that? king of Ethiopia. I think that that was him that, that uh, held off the Italians pretty well for quite some time and kind of embarrassed the Italian fascists. But anyway, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's the other thing. There's this, there is a direct connection between fascism and colonialism because these fascists wanted to build colonial empires. They looked, I mean, you know, we, it's, it's pretty well known today, but like Hitler was very inspired by Manifest Destiny and the, the genocide of Native Americans and uh, that the USA had accomplished and the eugenics programs in the USA. I mean, they were looking to places like the USA as inspirational. You know, Hitler was very into Westerns. He loved reading like cowboy stories and shit. So, um, you know, they, they, had, they had this very romantic idea and conception of colonialism. They saw it as, I mean, the, the whole project of Germany in Eastern Europe was basically colonialism. They wanted to have Lebensraum. They wanted to have space to, to live and breathe or whatever is the way that they were peddling it to the, <clears throat> to the people. So colonialism and fascism also have a very strong link. Um, and, you know, there were fascistic elements of the colonial, like, like for instance, the USA's programs in Vietnam, the fact that the USA helped kill a million communists in Indonesia through their uh, imperialist, colonialist kind of projects in Indonesia. Um, there, you know, there, there are all these overlaps uh, in terms of like liberal, neoliberal, bourgeois, imperialism and colonialism and the fascist aspirations for colonialism. So, yeah. all right. You know, it, it, was, it was highly oh, Selassie. I was just saying it was All right. Selassie. Look at that. Look at that. That's, that's something I just remembered from... 2004. <laughs> the last <laughs> time I good. studied that was 2004. So kudos to me for 15 years. Remembering that from 15 years it. ago. You did it. <clears throat> All right. The rational use of a irrational ideology. And this is why, okay, the subtext, the subtitle of this book is Rational Fascism and Anti-Communism, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the rational use of irrational ideology. Some writers stress the irrational features of fascism. By doing so, they overlook the rational politi politico-economic functions that fascism performed. And this is really important. Much of politics is the rational manipulation of irrational symbols. 
Certainly, this is true of fascist ideology, whose emotive appeals have served a class control function. This is what makes me really uh, terrified about the recent developments on the left of like American patriot socialism, draping, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, people trying to drape themselves in the USA flag, uh, demonizing decolonization and land back, and literally going on stream and saying, you know, oh, please don't do a white genocide yeah. to black and indigenous people. I mean, that's to me like very scary. Very, very, very scary. And remember that the <clears throat> this kind of rhetoric is also what caused, you know, the Christchurch shooting, Dylan Roof in Charleston, where uh, I'm from. Uh, many, many, many horrible, horrible things have happened uh, because people have bought into these ideas of like white genocide and stuff. This is a total tangent, but I'm just saying that like this, uh, this is this is kind of what they're talking about here: the rational use of irrational symbols to basically manipulate and control people, right? Uh, yeah. in, in communications, we sometimes talk about front speak and back speak, right? So there's like the front speak is what we say to the to the masses to kind of like manipulate them, and the back speak is like our actual working ideology. So with neoliberalism, there's like the front speak that, oh, the free market and austerity will lead to prosperity in the long run and blah, 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 blah. But the back speak is obviously like, we just want to make as much money for capitalists as we possibly, possibly can. (laughs) What? The good Morty. Thank you so much, the good Morty, for the very generous donation, $69. That's a nice number. Oh, nice. And said, smash the fash. Um... (laughs) The Good Morty has had some a, a windfall recently. Uh, I saw that. And we really appreciate. Yeah, we really appreciate you spreading the wealth, uh, the Good Morty, and uh, you, yeah, been supporting the show for a long, long time. So thanks so much. And definitely, if you're watching this, smash the fash. Good. It's always a good idea to smash the fash. Smash the fash <clears throat> and the subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most horrible thing I've ever heard. I love it. I had to. That's our new slogan. <laughs> I hope that's the first time that that sentence has ever been uttered, because if not... It can't be. It can't be. I'm not that original or creative. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Um, I'm, just, I'm looking through the through the chat real quick to make sure that I... We didn't miss anything. Oh, yeah, there's been uh, a lot of activity. That yeah, sorry, folks. It's kind of hard to. We're we're still learning how to do this kind of stream. So maybe when like one of it. But see, I want to listen to what you're saying when you're reading too. So we just have to be. <laughs> we have to use our ADHD to our advantage. We live in a subscription society. Yannick said, "Memes have ruined the word smash for me." Yeah. Uh it's true. All right. Um, I guess yeah. You want to. You want to pick it up from uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, first, first? First there was... First there was the cult of the leader. In Italy, Il Duce and Germany, der Fro- der, <laughs> der Führer Prinzip. Come on, you went to Middlebury for German, didn't <laughs> yeah. you? Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know what I did like, 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, with leader worship. <laughs> with leader worship. <laughs> oh, you, you just skipped state. by it. Oh, my God. No, I said it. You were just talking over me. I'm sorry that all you right, didn't hear me right. say that word perfectly. <laughs> with leader worship. With leader worship, there came the idolatry of the state. As Mussolini wrote, the fascist <clears throat> conception of life stresses the importance of the state and accepts the individual only insofar as his interests coincide with those of the state. Fascism preaches the authoritarian rule of an all-encompassing state and a supreme leader. It extols the harsher human impulses of conquest and domination while rejecting egalitarianism, democracy, collectivism, and pacifism as doctrines of weakness and decadence. And this is the thing, too. There's definitely, like, a worship of, like, war and conflict with the fascists. And they say that, Mm -hmm. like, that, like, fighting and violence and war is, like, a part of the vitality of life. That's a really important kind of component as well. And you kind of see that with like the Proud Boys and the, you know, the um, glorification of violence that they have. Uh, You know, you definitely see that in a lot of modern fascist movements. And, you know, this whole idea of like the the violent struggle, like, you know, strengthening mankind and blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, And pointing out like, you know, uh, and just like pointing out like weaknesses, you know, of, you know, whoever. Um, oh yeah, right. And finding you know the other group, the out group, whatever right. demonized group it might be. Um, Yannick's Yannick, you should know that all cats are comrades. All cats are comrades. 
Yeah, they, they, they're, they're, yeah, cats are anarchists. I think dogs <laughs> might be more Marxist Leninists, but cats are definitely anarchists, anarcho communists for sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> also, like, you pick it a up? cat, oh. if you die in your house, a cat, your cat will eat you. Yeah, we learned that on X. Dog might not. <laughs> or that was a Pomeran that was a Pomeranian, never mind. <laughs> oh, was it? I take it back. Mm. Yeah. But that's kind of Pomeranian ate you know? that lady. A Pomeranian ate that lady. I can't remember that episode, but I'm sure I saw really? it oh, when it was on TV originally. Oof. But I think that your, your cat that eating you. <laughs> yeah, your cat eating you when you're dead is communism. It's like you're sharing. It's like the Fremen in Dune. Yeah, I was just about the to body say, belongs like to you, but your water belongs to the tribe. Is <laughs> is water? The uh, water belongs. Comrades are basically the dog version of cats. Matthew Stone said. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, it's true. True. Fair. Cats are egoists. They live for no one but themselves and form bands and unions <laughs> according to what is useful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess cats are sternerists. That's that's probably true. <laughs> I eat you as you eat me. <laughs> that's actually a sterner, like almost a direct quote from Sterner. All right, uh, enough cat discourse. Um, okay, a dedication uh, to peace, Mussolini wrote, is hostile to fascism. Perpetual peace, he claimed in 1934, is a depressing doctrine. Only in cruel struggle and conquest do men or nations achieve their highest realization. The words are beautiful things, he asserted. Rifles, machine guns, planes, and cannons God. are still more beautiful. I mean, you see this like shit all the time on the right, too. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, still, it's a... Uh, well, look at every easy. fucking gun channel on YouTube and the way that they like oh. worship yeah, I know. guns. I mean, I'm not anti-gun myself because I believe that the working class, especially in the USA, needs to be armed especially if you're marginalized or oppressed or whatever. But, um, but like, we shouldn't be, like, no, worshiping, these, worshiping these, things. these things. Yeah, it's like fetishization for real. Um, and on another occasion, he wrote, war alone puts the stamp of nobility upon the people who have the courage to meet it. This is reminding me of that episode of The Office where Dwight Schrute, where, like, Jim gave Dwight all those, like, talking points from fascist speeches for the sales convention. God, Did I don't think I ever saw that. <laughs> oh, it's, he's like, the wheels of history are greased by blood. <laughs> uh, anyway, edgelordism, yes, for sure. But we have this in the USA, too. I mean, for sure, we have military worship and weapon worship. I mean, um, do you remember that show? Oh, my God. I used to love it when I was in high school. That show Mail Call with Arlie Ermey. Do you remember that show on the History Channel? You might not yeah, have been a big history channel. That sounds familiar, but yeah. So the guy who played um, the the drill instructor in Apocalypse Now, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. he did this show called Mail Call, and he would just be like, "This this flamethrower could kill thirty seven people in four <laughs> seconds. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful thing." And it's just like so fucking like it's like wow. And when, I, when, I, when I look back at it now, was it spelled M A I L or M A L E? It was M A I <laughs> M A L E is like the the hotel porn channel uh, version, <laughs> right? Well, I didn't know if they were just doing they were just like going going for it. I don't know. No, it's like people would write it. letters about the military, and he would just basically describe how it. how glorious the different killing implements were. Um, so yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. I was probably watching occasion, movie magic or beyond <laughs> 2000. <laughs> I watched all of that. All of it. Uh, on another occasion, he wrote, war alone puts the stamp of nobility upon the peoples who have the courage to meet it. Such like edgelord shit, really. Like I can totally, like, this is like incel <laughs> neckbeard shit. It's really, nothing has changed. Nothing has fucking yeah. changed since like 1921. This is the exact same kind of neckbeard <laughs> I get these comments on my YouTube channel yeah. from fascists that are like, a war puts the no stamp of nobility in the which well, way, you know, like somebody, men? Like somebody earlier in the chat said, like, why do they still use this? And I think the answer is that it fucking works. <laughs> Self-crit. It, it's like, Full Metal Jacket, not Apocalypse Now. I got my that is right. uh, yeah. U.S. Vietnam War movies confused. Sorry. <clears throat> oh, uh, Black Rifle Coffee. God damn it. Yeah. Still, this culture is very much alive. Um, <clears throat> all right. Um, ironically, most Italian army conscripts <coughs> had no stomach for Mussolini's wars, tending to remove themselves from battle once they discovered that the other side was using live ammunition. 
And that yeah. I know happened a lot in Ethiopia. That's a big reason why they didn't do so well in Ethiopia. Take it away, Grant. Fascist doctrine stresses monistic values. Ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer. One people, one rule, one leader. The people are no longer to be concerned with class divisions, but must see themselves as part of a harmonious whole, rich and poor as one. A view that supports the economic status quo by cloaking the ongoing system of class exploitation. This is in contrast to a left agenda that advocates the articulation of popular demands and a sharpened awareness of social injustice and class struggle. Okay, this is a really important... Uh, yeah, he says it in the next sentence. Monism is basically the... Uh, structure that's being identified here by Parenti. And this is really vital to understand the nature of fascism. So monism is this idea that we can unite the nation together. And again, we were talking about this earlier, the bourgeoisie and the working class can kind of come together and unite. And this is interesting because it echoes back to in the Communist Manifesto when we were talking about some of the early utopians. Remember when we were talking about Owen and those sorts of folks and mm -hmm. the early yeah. like French revolutionists. And they, they saw the people as like the sort of embryonic bourgeoisie and the working class together versus the king and the aristocrats and sort of the church as well. So like this, this idea goes back a long time and we still see it today. I, I think we talked, did we talk about this slop when we were reading the Communist Manifesto that like Obama is a huge monist and a, a really effective mm -hmm. like rhetorician of this kind of monism that like the American people need to come together Yep. The rich and the poor, the working class and the capitalists, we all need to come together for a stronger America, blah, 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 blah. Joe Biden right. tries to do the same thing. Doesn't He's not nearly as good at it as Obama was. But um, <laughs> this is like the liberal, the, 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 that's the liberal version of like what Parenti's talking about here right. with like a conception that the nation is a unit and that we, the class conflicts, those are like things of the past. We're going to come together. And we're going to have this monistic vision. Of course, that doesn't include like Jewish people or Bolsheviks or whatever other other you decide to um, make as your like Choose, de facto right. boogeyman or whatever, and foreigners and immigrants and all that. So um, there are still out groups, but within this like national or ethnic or racial in group, we have this like monistic construction that uh, pushes back against the idea of class conflict. So <clears throat> okay. This monism is, but remember that word, monism. That's a that's a key word. That'll be on the quiz. We should do oh. quizzes. We should do quizzes oh, like every yeah. like three or four episodes. We could do a test through the YouTube poll function. <laughs> that would be good. I think I'll see what I can do. I'll see what. So I can this do will be that. on the test, comrades. Monism. <laughs> Write this down. <laughs> and by the and way, it's, group, it's like your knowledge. Yeah, it's a socialist test, so it's going to be a group test. Like you're going to be tested as a class. Okay, no individualism here. So, Open encourage YouTube your test. comrades to study. Yeah, <laughs> fuck that. I'd quit. <laughs> Sorry, Louisa. You're part of the collective now. Okay, <laughs> Professor EJ, you forgot to assign his homework today. <laughs> Louisa's giving bigger wig the side eye. God damn it, this nerd. <laughs> I was gonna go see a movie tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, only have 30 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> We've now identified that uh, Bigger Wig is like the nerd and Louisa Ruth is like the Stacy. <laughs> the Chad. Sorry, I'm just teasing. I'm just joking. This is fun. This is fun. Teacher's pet. <laughs> hey, Duke's like, I'm going to bed. This is fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, it's okay, Desmond. It's all good. Um, the pirate chinchilla will watch over you in your dreams. Thank you for joining us and sleep well. <laughs> yeah, Louisa Ruth, I could see you being a Daria. That makes sense. All right. Um, I'm a, I'm a Daria. I feel like I'm more of a Daria than anything. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, okay. You're on that, right, sorry. that buttress <clears throat> by... Uh, this is in contrast to a left agenda that... Advocate... Yeah, we read that. Okay. Uh, buttressed by atavistic appeals... Oh, I had to look this word up. Atavistic, relating to or characterized by reversion to something ancient or ancestral. So it kind of means like a little bit like reactionary, but it's like, yeah, we got to go back to our ancient ancestral forms. <clears throat> this monism is buttressed by atavistic appeals to the mythical roots of the people. For Mussolini, it was the grandeur that was Rome. For Hitler, the ancient folk. 
a play written by a pro-Nazi Hans Jorst entitled Schlageter and performed widely throughout Germany soon after the Nazis seized power, Hitler attending the opening night in Berlin, pits folk mysticism against class politics. Oh, are we going to do August. This? Yeah, we're going to do a dramatic <laughs> reading. Okay, cool. The enthusiastic August is talking to his father, Schneider. So do you want to be the father or the son? I don't know. What do you want to do? Hmm. I'll be... I'll I, think be think, uh, I think you're what? the dad. I think you're more of a father okay. figure. I'll be Schneider. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be young August. August, you won't <laughs> believe it, Papa, but the young people don't pay much attention to these old slogans anymore. The class struggle is dying out. And remember, Schneider is an old kind of communist. The class Zoe. struggle is dying out, Papa. <laughs> so, and what do you have then? The folk community. And that's a slogan? Nine. It's an experience. <laughs> mein Gott. <laughs> our class struggle, our strikes, they weren't an experience, eh? Socialism, the international, were they fantasies maybe? They were necessary, but they are historical experiences. So, in the future, therefore, we'll have your folk community. Tell me how do you actually envision it? Poor, rich, healthy, upper, lower, all this ceases with you, eh? Look, Papa, upper, lower, poor, rich, that always exists. It is only the importance one places on that question that's decisive. To us, life is not chopped up into working hours and furnished with price charts. Rather, we believe in human existence as a whole. None of us regards making money as the most important thing. We want to serve. The individual is a corpuscle in the bloodstream of the people. There you go. So there the end. end scene. So you see, though, this, this is actually really fascinating because it gives you an idea yeah. into the ways in which they were kind of front speaking to the people. You're a part of something bigger than yourself. And by the way, tell me if this doesn't sound familiar. Not only with the fascists today, which it does, but also with the way that Obama and Biden and even Trump try to try to put things. You're a part of something bigger than yourself. You're a part of this nation. You're a part of this people with this, you know, destiny, this ancient past. You are one blood vessel in this bigger organism. You're part of something that's greater than yourself. Stop it with the historic class divisions. Those are things of the past. It's time to come together as one people, one empire. Listen, you don't even care about money. Money's not even important. <laughs> yeah, money's not. What are you? What are you? A materialist? Come on, yeah. get with the program. We're we're about spiritual fulfillment and fulfilling the destiny of the glorious people. Stop worrying so much about charts and profits and losses. We don't care about those things, even though we're secretly making sure that things. the bourgeoisie benefits from all of our programs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They say secretly to the side amongst each other. All right, that's it. Fascism, fun stuff. All right. <clears throat> There were there are one year long schools courses that you can go to in Germany, often part of the university itself, where they will fucking break down and practically download info into your head for college. Huh? What's this in reference? I can't to? tell if this is a good thing or a bad. Th I know it's kind of out of context. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> that sounds like that sounds good. <laughs> Maybe I'm missing something. Is it like reactionary knowledge? <clears throat> Um, that's also a major way they try to sell people in the military. This is very true. Be something bigger than yeah. yourself. Join the army. Yeah, for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> this is my favorite comment. No, don't ask for more money. You're so sad. This is so fucking good. This is such a good like interpretation of fascist ideology. <laughs> <laughs> This is great. Wow, that's great. Welcome aboard the Narrator 9000. Uh, yeah. Coming in. Oh, uh, and he was just saying that he, uh, Wilhelm was explaining that was just him expanding on like going to school in Germany. Oh, okay. I see. I see. It's like a cram school kind of thing, is what it sounds sort of sounds like. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, the cramming. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah, never mind. I hate cram schools. <laughs> <laughs> I've taught at them. It sucks. All right. Um. <clears throat>
Would you like me to continue? Yeah, where were we? I don't even know where we were. The Sun's comments. Oh yeah, are revealing. Yeah, yeah. The Sun's use comments your podcaster voice. The Sun's comments are revealing. The class struggle is dying out. Papa's concerns about the abuses of class. All right, all right. I'm, I'm, I, this is enough NPR vibe. <laughs> uh, uh, Papa's concerns about the abuses of class power and class injustice is facilely dismissed. What is this? Fresh a... air? <laughs> <laughs> it stinks like onions in here. As far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it is even falsely equated with a crass concern for money. None of us regard making money as important. Presumably matters of wealth are to be left to those who have it. We have something better. August is saying a totalistic monistic experience as a people, all of us rich and poor working together for some greater glory. Conveniently overlooked is how the glorious sacrifices are borne by the poor for the benefit of the rich. The position enunciated in that play and in other Nazi propaganda does not reveal an indifference to class, quite the contrary. It represents a keen awareness of class interests, a well-engineered effort to mask and mute the strong class <clears throat> consciousness that existed among workers in Germany. In the crafty denial, we often find the hidden admission. Sorry, I've, I've been typing things to delve secretly in, in Discord. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, sorry, Delve, I did not get those notifications, but that's really cool stuff, and I will pass that on because I did get in touch with somebody. Just so everybody knows, um, and if you're like a developer and you want to help with this, I'm working with some folks who are way better at this stuff than I am to try to bring back community captioning for YouTubers on like a mm. third-party platform kind of thing that we're trying to put together, and Delve just sent me some cool info about that. So Delve, I will, um, awesome. I will get back to you about that stuff, and I will pass on that information for sure. Uh, but yeah, that's something we're trying to do. So if you or if you're interested in working on that, this little PSA, let us know, and um, I can put you in touch with the with the person that's uh, trying to help with that. We're kind of thinking of making it kind of like a wiki where people can just like upload the captions, maybe even eventually have a player on the wiki site where it'll like play the YouTube video and load the community captions and have subtitles with. Because the most important thing that we're missing, not just I mean, because the captions are very very important for um, accessibility, but also. We used to be able to have our videos in like all these different languages, and it was amazing um, with the subtitles. But that YouTube took that away from us completely because they're assholes. So, okay, <clears throat> dang. I like that in the crafty denial, we often find the hidden admission, right? Yeah. So, um, they definitely are serving these these bourgeois class interests, and it's like. Thou art, thou doth protest too much, or whatever. Uh, you know, like, mm -hmm. no, we're not working with the bourgeoisie. What are you talking about? <laughs> we're totally on the side of the people, which is very much like a Trumpian thing. You know, Trump tries to act like a big populist and a big demagogue, but like, who's interested? Trump served the entire time he was in office. I mean, they all do that. But Obama does it too, and such. But like, um, I mean, it was <clears throat> Biden's just doing it now. Blatantly obvious. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I should say Biden's doing it now, too, with, like, the whole freaking infrastructure plan. Like, that's totally really just a big transfer of wealth to capitalists. Um, and they're, like, withholding the uh, the the climate stuff. They're, they're using the climate right. as, like, a, they're saying, oh, we can't give you these um, social safety nets because we got to get this climate change infrastructure stuff through. And then the climate change and infrastructure stuff is just a big gift being delivered to the capitalist class. So it's, like... Yeah, yeah. There and are then, like, any actual social features. programs are getting gutted in the meantime. Absolutely, yeah. And 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 you know, we have uh, you know this massive eviction crisis that they just keep kind of like delaying yeah, with this delaying. kind of disaster capitalism tactic of like keeping everyone kind of unstable and unsure about what's coming next down the pipeline and all. <clears throat> Luke Sow is very much like uh, giving us shit about our our reading pace. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Look, this is this is not just a, a reading show. This is also a chat show. We're hoping to read about fifteen pages per uh, per week per uh, episode. So, if you want to just listen to an audio version of the book without commentary, there's like two or three different versions on YouTube. But um, we will never brag about our pacing. <laughs> We're not speed running. That's for sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is bait to make me read it myself. <laughs> If if we get it if we get you to read it yourself, <clears throat> then uh, we have done our job, in my opinion. So sure, that's a fair assessment. 
and it is all very compelling. I mean, obviously, like we're reading it right now and you're hearing it, but um, it is very engaging. Um, oh, yeah. We are the most reading. engaging of hosts. <laughs> no, I, I mean, did not, you mean the book no, is I, engaging. I mean, the book is engaging. We're not, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, we the book's super whatever. engaging. Y'all should right, probably right, just right. like close your laptops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> going down to the going down to your local commie bookshop. Actually, you, you can obtain this. Um, you can obtain this. I'm sure the chat knows how you can attain this if you don't have it already. I'm not. We wouldn't gonna, suggest anything that was. <clears throat> we would never suggest that you break any service. laws or do anything that's against terms of service because that would be illegal and wrong. And as communists, we believe strongly in the principles of intellectual property. So, just so you know. All right. right. <clears throat> August is saying, uh, blah, blah, blah. Next page. Next page. We're at the patriarchy really? and pseudo revolution. Oh, I, I backed promise. it up. That's right. <clears throat> patriarchy and pseudo revolution. Actually, how much time do we have left? Okay. In about 10 minutes, uh, 10, uh, maybe 15 minutes, I'm going to invite uh, Brenton Langlon for a quick little uh, discussion about a project they're working on. So just so everybody knows. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Thanks right, for letting your, your co-host know. <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you that, didn't I? That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. I completely. I meant to tell you that when we were talking before the show, but I got distracted by talking about Jimmy John's and Papa John's. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Patriarchy and pseudo revolution. Understandable. <clears throat> Fascism's national chauvinism, racism, sexism, and patriarchal values also served a conservative class interest. <clears throat> Fascist doctrine, especially the Nazi variety, makes an explicit commitment to racial supremacy. Human attributes, including class status, are said to be <coughs> sorry, are said to be inherited through blood. One's position in the social structure is taken as a measure of one's innate nature. Genetics and biology are marshaled to justify the existing class structure, not unlike what academic racists today are doing with their bell curve theories and warmed over eugenics claptrap. And again, this is from 1997. The racist pseudoscience is like all the rage now with our conservative uh, fascistic uh, enemies. So this is kind of like, uh, yeah, very much predicting the future. Along with race and class inequality, fascism supports homophobia and sexual inequality. Among Nazism's earliest victims were a group of Nazi homosexuals, leaders of the SA stormtroopers. When complaints about the openly homosexual behavior of SA leader Ernst Röhm was, uh, and some of his brown-shirted stormtroopers continued to reach Hitler after he seized power, he issued an official statement contending that the issue belonged purely to the private domain and that an SA officer's private life cannot be an object of scrutiny unless it conflicts with the basic principles of national socialist ideology. So <clears throat> at first, as long as Rome was being like kind of useful as a violent uh, agent of, uh, <clears throat> of the SA, they were like tolerant of, the, of, of his homosexuality and you know, a lot of other gay members of, of uh, the Third Reich and the SA. The paramilitary SA had been used to win the battle of the streets against trade unionists and Reds. Remember, they were used to violently suppress socialism and unionism. The stormtroopers acted as a pseudo-revolutionary force. Pseudo-revolutionary, that's very important, keep that in mind. <clears throat> that appealed to mass grievances with a rhetorical condemnation of finance capital. So uh, originally, the SA were kind of like pseudo-socialistic and pseudo-populistic. And they were they they talked a lot about being like opposed to big capital, big finance, and all that kind of stuff. Um, when SA membership skyrocketed to three million in 1933, this was too discomforting to the industrial barons and military patricians. And this is where we have like Strasserism and all that um, come into the scene, <clears throat> which is like a Nazbol kind of fascism with like universal health care kind of thing that we still see today. Um, SA street brawlers who denounced bourgeois decadence and called for sharing the wealth and completing the Nazi revolution would have to be dealt with. Why? Because now the Nazis have established themselves enough that their alliance with the capitalist class has matured enough that they need to go in and clean house and get rid of all of the populist semi-socialistic elements within their street ball brawling ranks. Having used the SA to take state power, Hitler then used the state to neutralize the SA. Now, suddenly Rome's homosexuality did conflict with the National Socialist ideology. In truth, the SA had to be decapitated, not because its leaders were homosexual, though that was the reason given, but because it threatened to turn into a serious 
problem. Rome was about three, Rome and about 300 other SA members were executed, not all of whom were gay. Among the victims was veteran Nazi propagandist Gregor Strasser, who was suspected of leftist leanings. And then that's where we get the term Strasserism from. There were the two Strasser brothers were kind of like anti, they were more anti-capitalist uh, Nazis who had to be eliminated because they were making the capitalists uncomfortable. You want to take it away from here, Grant? <clears throat> Of course, many Nazis were virulently homophobic. One of the most powerful of all, SS leader Heinrich Himmler saw homosexuals as a threat to German manhood and the moral fiber of Teutonic peoples for a homosexual sissy would not procreate or make a good soldier. Himmler's homophobia and sexism came together when he announced, if a man just looks at a girl in America, he can be forced to marry her or pay damages. Therefore, men protect themselves in the USA by turning to homosexuals. Women in the USA are like battle axes. They hack away at males. Thus spoke one of the great minds of Nazism. Uh, in time, Himmler succeeded, succeeded in extending the oppression of gays beyond the SA leadership. Thousands of gay civilians perished in SS concentration camps. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously there's, there's nothing funny about this because of like the horrors of yeah. just like wiping out these people. But I, I do want to point out that like, this does sound so much like the fascist incel rhetoric that we hear today. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it, except like nowadays they're saying like, you know, the U.S. American fascistic incel red pill people are saying that like back in the day, if a man just looked at a girl, he'd be forced to marry her, pay damages. That was a good thing. We should go back. to that. You know what I mean? But it's like there's all this weird like psychosexual uh undercurrents to fascist ideology and it's like really fucking weird and creepy and dangerous as you can see i mean it, it leads to a lot of uh hate crimes and and, and again it echoes today we had the shooting and uh, that was in florida where they had the shooting in the gay nightclub right um mm -hmm. and then the shooting in the um of the asian women in the uh massage parlor place i mean like there's all these hate uh fucking uh what's his name the perfect gentleman uh whatever that guy, the, that fucking guy that killed all the people because he was like an incel. Um, there's strong ties between yeah. this kind of psychosexual, patriarchal, homophobic, you know, just bizarre toxic masculinity and, and fascism. And it's been that way since the very beginning. So this is Elliot Roger, yeah. So this is nothing new. Um, uh, the narrator says, you see weird psychosexual stuff with incels wanting assigned romantic partnerships based on attractiveness. Yeah. And by the way, you saw that as well in, because um, I want to talk about, you know, once again, going back to the idea that communism can, if left unchecked, if, if you know, put in the, if people are able to like carry the people away with this kind of rhetoric, communism can become fascism. Like look at Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. They were doing this kind of shit as well, where they were like forcing marriages, where they would, they were trying to like match ugly people with attractive people and what they saw as intelligent people with like unintelligent people to like balance the population through this like sexual breeding program, which is very much exactly like what the Nazis were doing. So um, there are these kinds of like, I, I don't know, like patterns or templates that um, you see surface again and again and again with these kinds of fascistic movements. Um, all right. <clears throat> disturbing stuff, to be honest. I, I don't really enjoy talking about this stuff at all. Uh, but it's important to kind of wrap your head around it, I think, if you want to understand fascism. Okay. Um, in societies throughout the ages, if able to find the opportunity, women have attempted to limit the number of children they bear. This poses a potential problem for a fascist patriarchy that needs vast numbers of soldiers and armaments workers. Women are less able to assert their procreative rights if kept subservient and dependent. So fascist ideology extolled patriarchal authority. Every man must be a husband, a father, and a soldier, Ilducci said. Women's greatest calling was to cultivate her domestic virtues, devotedly tending to the needs of her family while bearing as many offspring for the state as she could. Patriarchal ideology was linked to a conservative class ideology that saw all forms of social equality as a threat to hierarchical control and privilege. Again, does this sound familiar to you? The patriarchy buttressed the plutocracy. If women get out of line, what will happen to the family? This is exactly like yeah. fucking PragerU... I've seen videos from PragerU that basically say this exact same thing. And if the family goes, the entire social structure is threatened. What then will happen to the state and to the dominant classes' authority, privileges, and wealth? The fascists were big on what today is called family values. 
though most of the top Nazi leaders would hardly be described as devoted family men. You can pick it up from here, Slop. Yeah. In Nazi Germany, racism and, and anti-Semitism served to misdirect legitimate grievances towards convenient scapegoats. Anti-Semitic anti propaganda was cleverly tailored to appeal to different audiences. Super patriots were told that the Jews was an alien were told that the Jew was an alien and internationalist. Unemployed workers were told that their nemesis was the Jewish capitalist and Jewish banker. For debtor farmers, it was the Jewish usurer. For the middle class, it was the Jewish union leader and Jewish communist. Here again, we have a consciously rational use of irrational images. The Nazi might have been crazy, but they were not stupid. So, um, uh, Delve was asking who wrote this book. This is Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Parenti. Oh, the chat already answered, but there you go. Anybody who's watching this later on, Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Parenti. And yeah, the, uh, La Rose Rouge et Noir said uh, the CIA backed Pol Pot. And yeah, absolutely. That's, that's again, the, the, the liberals, the fascists, they work together, especially internationally. They have the same class interests. They're just both different strategies for preserving the capitalist uh, hierarchies and class structure. So, um, all right, let's see. Um, I think we could read a couple. Let's just finish the next page yeah, and we'll be we're done. We're honestly almost done. I think it, there's only 19 pages in the first chapter, but. Oh, you want to just kind of go through it then? And then, yeah. uh, well, I'll go ahead and send, you keep reading and I'll send a link to uh, Brenton while you, while you read. Okay. What distinguishes fascism from ordinary right-wing patriarchal autocracies is the way it attempts to cultivate a revolutionary aura. Fascism offers a beguiling mix of revolutionary sounding mass appeals and the, re and the reactionary class politics. The Nazi party's full name was the National Socialist German Workers' Party, a left sounding name. As already noted, the SA stormtroopers had a militant share of the wealth strain in their ranks that was suppressed by Hitler after he took state power. Both the Italian fascist and the Nazis made a conscious effort to steal the left's thunder. There was mass mobilizations, youth organizations, work brigades, rallies, parades, banners, symbols, and slogans. There was much talk about a Nazi revolution that would revitalize society, sweeping away the old order and building the new. For this reason, mainstream writers feel free to treat fascism and communism as totalitarian twins. It is a case of reducing essence to form. The similarity in form is taken a reason is taken as reason enough to blur the vast differences in actual class content. Writers like A. James Greger and William Ebenstein, countless Western political leaders and others who supposedly are on the democratic <clears throat> left, regularly lump fascism in with communism. Thus, Noam Chomsky claims the rise of corporations was in fact a manifestation of the same phenomena that led to fascism and Bolshevism, which sprang out of the same totalitarian soil. But in the Italy and Germany of that day, most workers and peasants made a firm distinction between fascism and communism, as did industrialists, bankers who supported fascism out of fear and hatred of communism, a judgment based largely on class realities. Yeah, so this is like all super important stuff that's going to be reinforced throughout the rest of the book. But like there are just massive like if you, if you think about the base and the superstructure, right, uh, that Marx describes, the base is like the the political, uh, sorry, the economic relations between the means of production, the workers, whoever owns the means of production, the, the, the very kind of material elements of human society where like we labor and engage with nature to create the things we need to live and survive, right? And then there's the superstructure, which is like culture, art, um, <clears throat> religion, all the, all the kind of more like abstract and ideal aspects of society. So Obviously, I think fascism and communism have huge superstructural differences, right? I mean, they're, they're just like, in terms of what they advocate for, in terms of the, you know, the, the for lack of a better term, aesthetic differences in terms of um, what uh, is being valued and held up as like worthy of human pursuit and all that kind of stuff. But I think more importantly, uh, the case that Parenti is making is there are massive base differences in terms of the economic relations, the class interests, the, the the relations between the workers and the means of production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of what's what's being said here. Um, you finished. You, you read a judgment based largely on class realities, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I was okay. gonna say, I think that I don't know if we want to leave, leave room like ten minutes room, we're probably just gonna want to halt 
here. Well, I can, I can, I'll just read this last page, and then Brenton's in the sidelines, and we'll bring Brenton okay. on and, and, and wrap it up. So, I'll just, br I'll just bring us to uh, the end of Friendly page seventeen. Event. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, years ago, I used to say that that way we'll be able to remember where we left off. <laughs> yeah. Years ago, I used to say that fascism never succeeded in solving the irrational contradictions of capitalism. Today, I am of the opinion that it did accomplish that goal, but only for the capitalists, not for the populace. Fascism is never intended to offer a social solution that would serve the general populace, only a reactionary one, forcing all the burdens and losses onto the working public. Really important idea. It's like completely in service to the bourgeoisie, if you look at it, you know, in terms of what they were actually doing, not what they were saying. Divested of its ideological and organizational paraphernalia, in other words, the superstructure, right? Fascism is nothing more than a final solution to the class struggle, the totalistic submergence and exploitation of democratic forces for the benefit and profit of higher financial circles. Fascism is a false revolution. Critical for anyone to understand that if you want to understand the points Perini's making here. It cultivates the appearance of popular politics and a revolutionary aura without offering a genuine revolutionary class content. It's a fake revolution. What was Trump's entire fucking campaign if not a fake revolution? Make America great again, blah, 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 blah. Fake revolution. Yeah. Doesn't actually change class relations, doesn't actually improve conditions for the working class at all. It's just all trappings, all talk, no action. The actions is to siphon more wealth to the capital class. It propagates a new order while serving the same old money and interests. Its leaders are not guilty of confusion, but of deception. That they work hard to mislead the public does not mean they themselves are misled. Again, the idea of the front speak, what we say to the masses to manipulate them and confuse them, and then the back speak, what we actually believe and what we're actually doing. Totally divergent thing. So we're going to leave here today. Um, we'll pick up next week on the friendly to fascism section. Um, and I think we did well. We actually, I think, uh, exceeded our goal. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, because I was hoping to get about 10% done every week, and we got about 10.5% done. So. Well, perfect. We did it. We All did right. It. So we that's did that. It, um, we did it. We met our goal for today, and um, all of that will be on the test. So make sure you study. Uh, now let's welcome to the show a surprise guest, our first guest here on Works and Theory, uh, Brenton Langle. And Gab Gabriel, thank you so much for, for saying uh, great read. We appreciate that, even though we know we're not the best Readers, I'm I have... I'm a great reader. You take that back. You are a great reader. All right. Grant, Grant's a great reader. <laughs> I'm uh, middling at best. But here's a great okay. writer we've got joining us. It's Brenton Langell. How I like to doing? say her name differently sometimes. <laughs> it, 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 that, that makes it more fun. <laughs> yeah. Just mix things up. How are you doing, Brenton? Say, it's been a while. I, I, I'm great. And I got to say, it's I, I'm really happy to see you. Um, it's like you, Bread Theory, and my channel, we're all doing like anarchist readings. Um, I've been doing a series of chapter by chapter breakdowns of homage to Catalonia uh, with uh, Bobby B, who's a two time combat veteran. So we've been breaking oh, wow. that down on my channel. Yeah. And he's that's awesome. <laughs> he's eating his hat over some of the tactics. <laughs> but um, it's also it's really, really fascinating. So I'm really glad that you're using your platform to educate people because it is so key and there are so few people like on left tube that actually do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, well, Grant and I both wanted to read more theory anyway and like, and just uh, get more grounded in a lot of this kind of stuff that we talk about. So it's kind of killing many word birds with one stone. <laughs> word um, birds. We're, we're the word birds. <laughs> killing all those word birds. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Grant's got Grant's got a very Grant has some very specific talents. <laughs> They're kind of hard to. I, I I one of those talents clearly is growing a beard. I am very jealous. Oh sir. yeah. Grant uh, is the beard. Not, it's just listen. Like, I I've seen Grant get like completely drunk from people buying him drinks at bars because of his beard. <laughs> it's true, he knows it. He's not going to deny it. It um, happens. Yeah. By the way, EJ, Grant. I noticed you're wearing like yeah. a like a Ren Fair shirt. I I I have one like that that I that I wore to my wedding. So it's <laughs> yeah. Are, have you worn a different one each stream? So EJ? far, I think I have. I've tried to. Well, I, Luna found this weird thing where like in Vietnam, you could buy Ren Fair shirts for like four dollars. <laughs> this was like four or five dollars or something. <laughs> So I'm, I'm like, I'm moving all to right, Vietnam right now. Dreams come true. Win. I'm just buying nothing but <laughs> Renfair shirts for now. 
I'm just going to have a whole wardrobe of red fair shirts. So, well, this is great because um, the, the last time I saw you, you were you were green. You were playing a goblin. So. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 going up on the non-compete live YouTube channel, or the archive of my D&D session, which Brenton hooked me up with uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. Um, that was really awesome. Bad. Yeah, well, it took it took them a while to get me the VOD, and now I've got it, and it took like four <laughs> hours to download it. I, I don't need to explain myself to you. I do need to explain what Brenton's doing here with us today. Yeah. Brenton is here to talk about your project, uh, Derudi, right? You want to you want to introduce that a little bit and tell me what what if and when you want me to throw things on screen. I've got your links here. Perfect. So um, first off, uh, for those of you if you're just now getting to know me, I've been in the uh, the breadcast verse for a little while. Uh, I am a former OWS activist. I'm the author, the Ringo nominated author of first Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, uh, the fourth issue of which is shipping. Um, and my second project uh, has launched and that is Derudi Shadow of the People. And this is a uh, Kickstarter to finance a comic series about the life and death of Buenaventura de Rudy, uh, who was a famous anarchist. And uh, we're, we're going to get into that in the links. Uh, but uh, yeah, so EJ, um, if you, if you want to pull up the short little thing, I think it's the video. I the sent trailer? You. Yeah, the trailer's good. Yeah, you got that. Okay. Do you have that one? Yeah, I got it. I think so. Yeah, sharing it now. We actually showed this oh. on Breadcast like a couple weeks ago. Oh, this is not the trailer. Um, this is... You, you did show the trailer before. This is um, who was Buena Ventura de Rudy. This is a quick oh, bio okay. that I made. So this is new. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Um, do you want to show the whole thing? Yeah, let's do this because it'll catch everybody up and you get to okay. hear my hammy acting. I have a glitch. So unfortunately, I can't like just full screen this. It's going to be in this silly player window. So I apologize about that. But let's see. Everybody can see our reactions. <laughs> more than half a million pesetas from the Bank of Spain. A more than hefty sum, which Derudi quickly and quietly gave away to struggling families, radicals, and revolutionaries to provide for food, schooling, and the purchase of much-needed weapons for the coming civil war. Soon, Derudi became a hero of almost mythical significance to Spain's downtrodden, and a hated bandit assassin and firebrand in the eyes of the powerful and wealthy elites who ruled over them. A born leader who hates the very idea of leaders, Derudi is charismatic, jovial, and deeply committed to his struggle for freedom and justice. And it is this passionate struggle to birth a new and better world which has prompted him to carve a swath of revolutionary violence across five countries and two continents. On the way, assassinating anti-union trigger men, the corrupt bishop who paid them, and carrying out a failed attempt on the life of that very same King Alfonso XIII. Thrown into a French prison and facing both extradition and execution, Derudi was saved by a committed workers' movement and legal technicality. And when the war Derudi had prepared for his entire life broke out in the form of a fascist coup, the soul of Spanish anarchism returned to his native country and led the people of Barcelona against their own invading military. And impossibly, mystifyingly, Derudi led them to victory. For the first and only time in recorded history, a modern, mechanized, professional army was decisively defeated by a force comprised of ordinary people defending their homes. A handful of farmers and factory workers armed with handmade bombs and antique rifles stopped the fascist war machine dead in its tracks. And under Derudi's leadership, along with the rest of the anarchist militants known collectively as the CNT-5, the entire city of Barcelona was collectivized, leading to a spontaneous outpouring of revolutionary joy that shone with the promise of a new golden age of freedom and equality, which a young visiting writer by the name of George Orwell recognized instantly as a state of affairs worth fighting for. Thus the blacksmith, bandit, and international fugitive became a custodian of a miracle and soon, Buenaventura de Rudy found himself at the head of a force of 10,000 anarchists in a desperate march to safeguard their revolution and rescue the city of Madrid from the fascist general known as Francisco Franco. And there we are. <laughs> wow, that was, uh, <coughs> that was really awesome. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know much about Derudi, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. I've I've just not read much about it, so maybe I will 
need to read your uh, comic. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. like what went into writing it, the research, and um, what so kind of this... did you take any kind of like liberties with the story, or were you trying to be like pretty much close to history, or how well, did that work? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, all right. So this actually goes back to like by the well, reason I became an anarchist partially. Um, so I start I started like getting interested in anarchism around 2010. Um, cause I'd been arguing with people online about it and I realized anarchists weren't what I thought they were and to win the argument, I would have to go and learn about it. So then I went, I learned about it. I won the argument. And then like six months later, I was like, ah, they were right the whole time. <laughs> Property is theft. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, like I started wanting to write, um, I read George Orwell's homage to Catalonia, which we are going over on my channel. And I started really getting interested in the Spanish Civil War and this new society they were building. And so I started to write a play about it called <coughs> No Gods, No Kings. And I got about halfway through and I was like, I feel like I'm just rewriting um, Homage to Catalonia and that already exists. And I, I don't want to rewrite that or do my own version of it. But in the book, Orwell kept talking about a group called the Friends of Derudi. And I, and I kept, I'm like, who, who the fuck is this Derudi guy? <laughs> so um, I looked him up and I was just like, oh, 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 man. And I realized, like, this guy is one of the coolest people that's ever lived. And he's, like, one of the great unsung heroes of history. Like, none of us have ever been told much about him. So uh, right. I did as much research as I could. Thank God for um, AK Press, by the way, who've gotten behind the series. Uh, they published this uh, English language biography, which is by Abel Paz. So this mm -hmm. thing is huge. This is one of seven books I read <laughs> to write this series. And... Here, it will be weird because I've got a filter on, but just you can see like how many of these pages I've spent time like this is this well gone. Oh, over. yeah. Um, right. Abel Paz actually was there. Uh, he was like 15 when the Spanish Civil War broke out. So and he was uh, jailed by the Francoish regime. So like he was both an anarchist militant and a historian. Um, so mm -hmm. it's just a real gift to us that this was published by AK press. It was uh, it translated into English by Chuck Morse. So anyway, oh, I wow. read the biography. Yeah. And um, really got, this was right around the same time that I got involved with Occupy Wall Street, which really sort of, mm -hmm. if you were on the ground for that, it, regardless of what the press would say, it was at its core, like an anarchist movement. Like you can look into Mark Bray. He, he talks about that. Um, so I was kind of wrapping my head around all of this and partially it was because I believed in it, but also partially I'm very much a method writer. I believe you should try to live your stories. Um, and so, you know, I, I can admit as a writer, part of it was I wanted to understand anarchism because I found it so compelling so I could write about it. And a big part of it is understanding Derudi's life. Um, so that eventually led to me writing a screenplay um, which has been optioned by Enon Films. They're trying to get that made into like a mid-budget war epic, which will be amazing. And oh, that'd be awesome, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and when I realized I could make comics uh, and get them financed through Kickstarter so that I could pay my artists, uh, the, the next story after Swaza just had to be Derudi. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because, you know, while we try to get that movie made, uh, this is a chance for me to make the series like exactly the way I envision it in my head, um, you know, mm -hmm. where all we really need are um, myself, my artist, my colorist and our Kickstarter backers. Um, so, yeah, we've been uh, we've been producing the, the book. The first issue is, is done and we've got it financed. Um, Robert Evans of Behind the Bastards got behind it, uh, as did AK cool. Press and the uh, Anarchist Library, which was amazing. Crime Think liked it and Crime Think doesn't like anything. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. It, I'm really, I was, I've really been blown away by the response of the anarchist community. Um, Breadcast, you you you've mentioned it before, and uh, your audience has come over and really helped us out, particularly at the beginning when things were hard. Um, oh, cool. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And so, like, yeah. I mean, at this point, um, my main goal with this, uh, with the Kickstarter, and with everything that I'm doing, is to get this story out to as many people as possible. Not just so that I can make sure that I, I have the money to pay Jaime uh, and Anna. Um, but also to make sure that we can, you know, kind of paint Derudi's name across the sky, because, you know, this is a guy who lived at one of the darkest periods in human history and uh, kind of was about one of the best possible people you could be if you were born into that situation. 
Um, hmm. So yeah, that's why I find them so fascinating. Do you want me to show you any show off any pages of the? Uh, yeah, yeah, please do. You you yeah, do you, is there any specific uh, page you want to? Uh, I mean, there's some. Uh, like... Start with the beginning, uh, like the first three okay. pages. Okay. And EJ, do you have the link to the uh, the video? Kickstarter or GoFundMe or whatever. Oh, oh, the Kickstarter. Yeah. E, e, can you throw that Let me get that chat for you. Right now, I'll, uh, I'm going to drop the book. Kickstarter into the private chat. We can also, if Got you it. guys want to see the um, uh, the trailer for the comic later, I can show you that as well. Hang on. Uh, do, there's the Kickstarter, and then all right. There's the, the Kickstarter trailer. if you want to back this. And well, I assume you can get a copy left. if you back it, right? Say what? You get a copy if you back it, right? Like, yeah, it, it depends on the level you want to back it. On the level, yeah, so yeah. you can gotcha. back it for a dollar. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you if you do uh, five dollars or more, you get a thank you in the digital version. You get a digital copy of that and a digital copy of the first issue of Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, which that makes it about <laughs> sixty six pages of sixty eight. Awesome. Um, yeah, full color comic pages. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so here at the beginning, I love this intro because Derudi was apprenticed to a radical blacksmith named uh, Melchor Martinez, who told him, you know, he told his parents, essentially, because his parents wanted him to be an intellectual. Uh, his dad was a railway worker, and Derudi was like, no, I want to be a, a worker like my dad. And, That's really um, funny because all the blacksmiths in, is that intentional? All the blacksmiths in, like, Super Nintendo Japanese role-playing games are always named Melchior? Is that why? <laughs> I Or is that I just a so. coincidence? <laughs> Like in Chrono Trigger, remember there's like Melchior's Blade? I'm sorry, this is such a deep cut nerd thing, but That's, Grant knows what I, I'm talking about. I, I hope whoever is making Chrono Trigger is the it's a secret, secret anarchist. like crypto anarchist. <laughs> I kind of doubt it. It'd be amazing. I think they might be spelled differently. Anyway, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I totally took the wind out of your sails there. No, <laughs> that, was, that was perfect, and I, I hadn't even thought about it. <laughs> So, yeah, um, he actually told his parents, like, okay, well, I'll train your son to be a, um, I'll train your son to be a master blacksmith, but also a socialist. And the, everybody mm -hmm. in the family was behind that. So, uh, Derudi grew up, like, basically, like, between, you know, smithing stuff in his shop and learning the, the art of metalworking, like, debating uh, socialist and revolutionary socialist philosophy, which was really cool. Um, so this, the sequence here, if you come down, the lyrics are from, uh, the song, which is in the, um, trailer. Um, mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. we can, yeah, and we can play that if you want to, but, uh, this is the English language version of it. The trailer's in Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. which by the way, I didn't, I, I thought it was, and I didn't mention it. Oh, you weren't even on the stream with us, but when we watched the, the, the trailer on breadcast, I was thinking the whole time that sounds like Javi and it's Javi, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. so cool that yeah. you got Javi to do that song for your trailer. Um, everyone should he, subscribe to Cunado de Esquerdas if uh, you want to see some really interesting, like a brilliant musician uh, who also has some really cool takes uh, from a Spanish perspective on uh, communism and anarchism and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, it, Enon Films actually got him and uh, they're oh. a viewer of yours, so they may have encountered him through your channel if you've put his stuff up. <laughs> oh, yeah. We talk to Javi all the time and have him play songs and stuff with us all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, anyway, uh, th this song, it was uh, taken sort of as the, an anthem of the CNT Phi. Uh, before that, um, it was a um, actually like a Polish Solish, socialist anthem uh, that, so, that mm. was rewritten and then sang in Spanish. Um, what's funny is I changed some of the lyrics to make them make more sense to people who weren't back in, you know, uh, that particular era of Spain. And I accidentally changed the lyrics to make them closer to what they were in the original Polish version. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Actually, let's go ahead and let's watch the let's watch the trail real quick. It's kind of short. Yeah, so yeah it's just like kinda... two and a half minutes. And we we all want to hear Javi sing, I think. So that's always nice. Here we go. Uh, okay. Negras tormentas agitan aires, nubes oscuras nos impiden ver, aunque nos espere el dolor y la muerte, contra el enemigo nos llama el deber. 
El bien más preciado es la libertad. Hay que defenderla con fe y valor. Alza la bandera revolucionaria que del triunfo sin cesar nos lleva en pos. Alza la bandera revolucionaria que del triunfo sin cesar nos lleva en pos. En pie el pueblo obrero a la batalla hay que derrocar a la reacción a las barricadas a las barricadas por el triunfo de la confederación a las barricadas a las barricadas por el triunfo de la confederación yeah there's Javi. <laughs> fantastic yeah and i apologize you could just uh disregard destiny there in the corner um, <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know that would come up <laughs> <laughs> no it's 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 funny um yeah. no but yep. the uh <clears throat> no that's really a beautiful trailer and uh and it makes me really want to read actually I, I now have the comic so i will read it but i will uh <laughs> we'll chip some money into your kickstarter actually um if you yeah well I'll, I'll talk to you about that offline but anyway um the uh no it's a very cool project um it, how much time is left on the kickstarter uh two days uh so you I better get on board yep. i'm doing it You're right now going. ej good grief go sell your bitcoin <laughs> go sell your dogecoin Mm -hmm. And uh, support Derudi on Kickstarter. I'll share that link one more time in the chat. Yeah, uh, perfect. We have 56 hours as of right now. <laughs> well, let's get it done, folks. Um, no, it's a really cool project, and I. Yeah, I so, but but looking at the comic that you sent me, uh, it's just like there's gonna be multiple editions. Yeah, that's you just have the so, first issue. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. So how many issues are there gonna be? Uh, probably somewhere between. Uh, I think at the high end. 12 low end eight maybe 10 it's are you are you are you taking notes are you still taking notes because i have uh, notes oh, oh i'll take notes. on the ending yeah. i have an idea for the ending oh you so do. think about it okay let's think about it let's do you remember the movie rudy yeah 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 <laughs> i think that you should end the comic with everyone going de rudy de rudy de rudy <laughs> i think you're on like everyone thing. in the football stadium for some reason they'll be in a football stadium and everyone just Chance Derude is that? that so that's I might be able to you. work that in. Uh, I think All the right. comic is he, 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 <laughs> spoiler. Like he's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like it's like fifty years yeah. later at a at a, at a local yeah. football <laughs> at a, local at a high school football game. game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, like, um, as far as we are in the in the series, so um we are at this point, um, we're about 13 pages into the original screenplay that I wrote. Um, and I don't know how much time certain issues will come. I, I will tell you, issue two is going to meet Nestor Machno. Nice. Which, yeah. That's pretty which, interesting. Yeah, which did happen in real life. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. Is Machno gonna just like dispatch anybody <laughs> for like well, being a Macna reactionary will, yeah Macna will be incredibly cool that's all i'm going to say about it uh i really i loved what, writing the <clears throat> scene with him and Macno. that was like the Macno is who i was because because i might play in your uh D, D game where you play mm -hmm. uh derudi um and i was thinking of maybe being mac i, I, I was trying to think between mm -hmm. Macno or john brown i'm because uh, brenton plays in a yeah. D, D game where you play historical figures uh yeah, it's it's Derudi <laughs> right now running around with um, Rasputin, Lord Byron, and Nikola <laughs> Tesla through like we just finished the storming of the Bastille. <laughs> That's amazing. That's and I'm pretty fixing good. the the focus on my computer. There, buy buy <laughs> buy Paz's book. <laughs> buy my book. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, um, well, really, yeah, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So what I was going to say to your question earlier, uh, like, did I um, stick to history? So uh, this is a story first and foremost. This is historical fiction, uh, but I stuck as close to history as possible. You have to make changes to certain things like to make it work within the 
kind of like Hollywood screenplay format. If you ever want anything to get made, is anything other than like a documentary. Um, right. So uh, there are changes, but when I did make changes, I did them in such a way that I wanted to express the dramatic essence of what happened. Um, so like, for instance, uh, a good example of a change, um, if you go to the pages, by the way, that I sent you, click towards the end, uh, like, like go to, towards like page oh, like okay. 20 or so, um, when, when you see them coming into the courtroom. Yep, I think I see that. Uh, let me... <clears throat> Make sure I got the right window shared here. Okay, uh, is that it? <clears throat> Let's take a look. Uh, yeah, though, if you yeah, if you keep going, so we have this this small group of anarchists break into the courtroom. Uh, several <laughs> of them get killed and are overwhelmed by the police. But then the cop here comes up and whispers to the judge, and we have this: "How large is the crowd, and how many officers?" <laughs> mm -hmm. At which point, boom! Uh. In through the door comes the crowd. <laughs> Um, now, <clears throat> this did not happen, um, okay. but the reason I have this here is because there were two big factors that led to Derudi's release. Um, he was in prison for a month uh, for attempting to assassinate the Spanish king, and the Argentinians were sending uh, a steamer. And if he was extradited to Argentina, they were going to straight up execute him. Ironically, even though he didn't actually commit any crimes while he was in Argentina. <laughs> um, but once. anyway. Yeah, for once. <laughs> so, um, like, the two th big major pressures on them were one, it they the steamer the steamship didn't get there in time, and it was literally the law they had to let Derudi go. He was a foreign national. He was accused of foreign crimes, and they and there was no one to take him, so they couldn't keep him past thirty days. It had been thirty one days, um, and then uh, on. But on top of that, what I wanted to to do was to dramatize the pressure that the actual anarchist movement was putting on them at the time because uh, covering the Cecily McMillan trial like you have no idea how much of a difference that kind of sustained pressure can make but that's difficult to you know this in real it's not life very visual yeah, exactly. In real life, it, it's protests and letter writing campaigns, and, and you know, but to make it visual to dramatize that pressure, I had the actual people break into the into the courtroom. So yeah, I basically yeah. dramatized the fear that was going on in the judge's mind that led to releasing Derudi. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and, and I also I want to make sure that like you know that was a lesson that I learned uh, with the Cecily McMillan trial that you know if the if the upper class and the state knows you're paying attention to them and there's a lot of you and you are committed, they are going to treat that person far more kindly than they otherwise would. Uh, and I think that's right, right. a lesson for direct action that we all can uh, learn about. So um, that's a change. There, there's some other changes that happen like later on in the series, but every time that I do it, like um, I want to make sure that if I change something, it, is, it, it may not be literally true, but it is symbolically true in the right, context right. of the story of Daruri's life. Um, now, if you want to also, if you can go back, there's a page where he's standing there in, in the handcuffs. Uh, we've seen it a couple of times. Can you find that one? I think it's like around page 10-ish. I think. <clears throat> oh, wait, page 10-ish? Hold on. I think Let so. Me, Something uh... in, that range, in that range. It might be a bit beyond that. Hold on. I've got, <clears throat> I've got him in the prison. Yeah, not in the prison. Keep going. Though he's Before in prison that? Uh, after that, when, after he's, that. when he's in the courtroom. Like he's standing and talking in the handcuffs? Yes, talking to the judge okay. uh, in the handcuffs. Yeah, I think I got it. <clears throat> yep, here we go. So if you go, go up just a little bit to see the top right. So we've got, you mm -hmm. call us criminals down here. And perhaps you are right, as revolution and law cannot cohabitate, revolution is always illegal. That is a direct quote from Derudi. Uh, um, awesome. And then if we come into here, we have um, <clears throat> the last page where he's talking there. Um, you know, Your Honor, I can only conclude that I was born to it. That's mine. And that is from the earliest days of my most tender years, the first thing I saw was suffering. Direct Derudi quote. Mm -hmm. Pop to the next page. 
I see my father working tirelessly through exhaustion and sickness, his calloused hands and sunken face growing old before his time. This is a paraphrase of a Rudy quote that he um, that I visualized. Um, I see mm -hmm. my mother weep because my sister asked for bread and she couldn't afford to buy it for us. That's direct, real Derudi quote from a letter to his brother. I see my grandfather mm -hmm. seated in his rusted wheelchair, punching his legs in anger as his grandson is sent off to fight in Morocco, while the rich buy workers' sons to take their own children's place. Boom, Derudi, right there. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, that speech, a good portion of it, is taken directly from his letters. And a lot of the dialogue that you will find, like, whenever I could work in, like, the real historical record, I did. It just, uh, you know, made sure that it worked and it would still be an engaging uh, and fun story that works the medium that it's in. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's really cool. Well, I, I uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share the link to the Kickstarter one last time. Um, mm -hmm. We're, uh, we're running out of time copy. here for the show. Oh, you got oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Slops. Slops got your back there. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think this is pretty cool. I hope everybody will consider supporting it. And uh, you could also actually... Throw your uh, YouTube channel link in the description, in the private chat too, Brenton, because um, oh, yeah. folks should uh, be sub you. to you as well. Brenton, were you actually, you were the, were you the DM in that um, game that Aaron was, uh, not mine, no. Joe was doing? No, 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 I haven't DM'd in years. I'm a good DM. I prefer to be a player though. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, our, I didn't uh -huh. think, I didn't think that was the case, but then I, I thought like, my, maybe my memory is so bad that... <laughs> I can't even remember. But. No, Brenton like hooked me up with it. Um, okay. with, yeah. the, with that job. Well, I guess I could just link to your trailer page and people can subscribe to you there, right? Yeah, well, well here, so. actually, here's my Kickstarter page that just makes it easier um, right there. Uh, but cool. yeah, okay. you, they can subscribe to me through the trailer page as well. Um, All right. Yeah, they can. <sighs> But yeah, it, cool stuff. thank you very much uh, for this, EJ. You know, uh, I love what yeah. you do with your channel. And, um, you know, w again, like I said at the beginning of this thing, to kind of bring it full circle. Um, I love that you're educating people on theory, that you're pushing for direct action, that you're, you're getting people to move for community engagement. And to re you know, th there is so little of that that I see sometimes out of the online left. And it's, it's yeah. as an activist, you know, uh, who was, you know, really involved in Occupy Wall Street and, you know, got kneed in the spine by a cop and thrown into a motorcycle. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. over, yeah. It was the adrenaline. It didn't hurt until much later. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, the way it, I've but heard, like, heard that a lot of times for people. <clears throat> yeah, but, it, but it, 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 it matters what you're doing. So, so thank you very much. And, uh, well, thank you. That, that is kind of the direction we want to go more and more in. So, like, you know, next year, Luna and I are going to try to start talking more about community gardening and getting um, just doing like things in your community to try to build class consciousness and build closeness. And some of the stuff that I see here in Vietnam where people are just a lot more tight together and closer with each other and everything. So we're going to start uh, moving in that direction over the next year or so. But yeah, that's the that's the name of the game. We all got to get out there and, and make things happen. Um, but yeah, I hope that everyone supports uh, your, your your Kickstarter here. I hope everyone checks it out. And we'll have to have you back on for a for a fuller conversation in the in the near future, Brenton. Um, but for yeah, now, I think Grant's getting a little cranky because it's past his <laughs> no, bedtime. That's not even so. true. It's <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, make sure you subscribe to the Slop Stash too. Eventually, one day he might even come out with another video. I might even make um, a new video soon. It's I'm, I'm subscribing. <laughs> if I think I might already be subscribed to Slop Stash too, but I'm going to try and see if I'm not. Yeah, I'll throw it in the old. Redo, try to redo it. And you'll throw and that then, in the thing. If it says you've just unsubscribed, click the button again. <laughs> yeah, just keep clicking it until you're sure that you're subscribed. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Try experimenting with even and odd numbers of clicking, and then eventually yeah. you'll find yourself. Subscribed. Wait, did you put it in the chat? Oh, you did. You put it in the. Comment. I put it in the, the public chat. I'll throw it in the. I can put it in the private chat too for you. Yeah, in the in, in the private secret chat. This is like specifically just for Brenton. I just did very <laughs> VIP service for yeah, you. Um, but yeah, is any final thoughts you want to share, uh, Brenton, before we before we take off? I mean, what I would say is, uh, so if you can support the comic, please do. There are also ways to support the comic if you don't have money on you. You know, and I totally mm -hmm. understand that uh, yeah. as, you know, uh, shares are as good. They all help the algorithm, uh, the, the almighty algorithm. And the thing is, is that the better this thing does, <clears throat> 
the more the more normies are going to see it <laughs> and yeah, hopefully yeah, yeah. more people can really be inspired by Daruti's story because like i don't know it's he died nearly a hundred years ago um mm -hmm. and since finding you know this record of of his life and creating this art based around it uh, uh you know there there is a connection and it's a connection that i feel both to history and to the the anarchist community like more widely as a whole it's it's creating inroads not just between me and, and ej uh but between me and ej and you and everyone who has been pulling for this new and better world derudi is, is mm -hmm. someone who was absolutely committed to leaving the world better than he found it and uh very famously said um you know that each of us carries a new world here in our hearts and that that world is mm -hmm. growing in this moment uh and that's true for all of us so build it adelante <laughs> yeah absolutely thank you so much for joining us brenton good luck with your uh, kickstarter and can't wait to read uh this and all the other future editions of derudi absolutely solidarity <laughs> solidarity um <clears throat> and as for you slop stash yes uh yeah what are your what are your final thoughts after learning a little bit about derudi learning a little bit about fascism learning a little bit about Ourselves. What else do we talk about? Poetry. Oh yeah, we did. And all the friends we made along the way. Yeah, and are you gonna eat that sandwich now in front of me like a jerk? Yeah, <laughs> it's real stinky. It is the stinkiest God. sandwich I've ever had in my life. I want that stinky sandwich so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's real sweaty too. Uh, oh my God, I want it so bad. Well, anyway, that that's the anyway. slop stash. You could subscribe to the slop stash at YouTube.com/slopstash. Eventually, we if might you... even have videos. If you want to see me eat sausage. a sweaty sandwich, you can. Subscribe. You can record a video right now before you go to bed, and, I mean, and edit it tomorrow. I mean, you could about like, half a Jimmy John's. Or it could just be this. This isn't any of Jimmy John's sandwich. <laughs> what is it? It's a substation too. Well, it's Jersey Mike's. Not oh, Jersey Mike's. I hate you. Jersey Mike's was, are the biggest sandwiches. It, they were. It was enormous. It was a big sandwich. <sighs> All right. I'm tired and I'm hungry now, so I'm going to I'm going to leave you now. Everyone subscribe to the Slop Stash on on Twitch. We're going to raid into Squid Punk, so please stand by if you're watching on Twitch. Uh, okay. Squid Punk is streaming and will be raided into presently. If you're watching on YouTube, please send Jersey Mike sub sandwiches to me in Vietnam immediately in the mail. Just mail them to American Johnson, Vietnam. Vietnam. They'll get to me. The our, our comrades will make They'll sure figure that it comes it out. to me. All right. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. I'm going to go cough a lot now and, and eat some food. Bye. Bye, y'all. And goodbye, YouTube people.